What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about a behemoth of topics, okay? We're going to talk about antiplatelets, anticoagulants, and thrombolytics, all the blood thinning medications. We're going to get into them. But what I want you to do is, before we actually get started in this video, if it makes sense, if it helps you, if you really do like it, please support us. Hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and then please subscribe. I know I say this a lot in every video, but I really mean it. If you guys get a chance, go down the description box below. There's a link to our website. On there, you'll find amazing notes, amazing illustrations. And the reason why I encourage that is because these videos are filled, packed filled with information. They're time consuming. There's a lot of things to go over, a lot of talking, a lot of drawing. I think one of the best ways is by actually following along with me grabbing the notes, grabbing the illustrations, and then filling in some of the spots as we go through this video. I think will really help you guys to understand, reduce the amount of times that you have to go over something, watch the video again. So please check those things out. I think it'll enhance your learning. But nonetheless, let's get started on this topic. When we talk about all of these medications, antiplatelets, anticoagulants, and thrombolytics, I think that they best fit, okay, with their mechanism of action, if we talk about what phases of hemostasis they affect. Now we are not gonna go through all the depths of hemostasis. It'll take way too long. We already have a video on that in our hematology playlist. Go check that out if you guys want way more detail on it. What I want us to understand is there's three primary phases that I want us to really think about with hemostasis. And that's the platelet plug formation. That kind of forms your primary hemostatic plug. And then afterwards, there's the coagulation cascade and the fibrinolytic mechanisms, okay? These are the three primary phases, and why I think this is important is because the drugs that we're gonna talk about, antiplatelet, anticoagulants, and thrombolytics work in these three particular phases of hemostasis. So if we have the basic understanding of how those phases occur, all we need to do is talk about how the antiplatelets fit into that, how the anticoagulants fit into it, and how the thrombolytics fit into those phases, okay? so. <clears throat> First stage here, platelet plug formation. It's not complicated, right? The vessels naturally, your endothelial cells naturally can inactivate your platelets. The way that they do that is they actually release particular molecules such as nitric oxide, prostacyclin, and what that does is, it's really cool, but it kind of keeps the platelets inhibited. So there's a the platelet, it's inhibited. Can't bind to the endothelium because it's actually gonna be repelled by these particular molecules. Now, Endothelial cells become damaged, blood vessel becomes damaged, loses the ability to release nitric oxide, release prostacyclin. Now it wants to go and attach to the subendothelial layer. See this blue lining here of the blood vessel? That's collagen. So that's the subendothelial lining. And there's a particular protein here that we're gonna zoom in on here in just a second, but it's actually very well present in this subendothelial layer. And this protein is called von Wilderon factor and platelets, they don't love that one mode on factor. All right, they love it. And so what happens is whenever they're not being inhibited by nitric oxide, they're active, they love to come and bind to the actual von Wildebrand factor. And then they form like this plug here of where the vessel is actually injured. But what's really cool is once they form this plug, once they kind of this plug starts beginning to form, platelets become activated and they release all these different types of molecules. We'll talk about some of them, but things like ADP, thromboxane A2, they'll secrete things like von Wildebrand factor, they'll secrete things like fibrinogen, so many different molecules. And so what we gotta figure out is, how can we utilize antiplatelet agents to stop the platelets from forming that plug? Because it may seem like it's a, it's a good thing to stop, right? And that's, that's important whenever patients are pathologically forming clots. Now naturally, you injure a vessel, you want to be able to form a clot. That's a natural physiological process. But if a patient is forming a pathological clot, you want to prevent that pathological clot from forming. How do we do that? Let's take this particular process in here where the platelets are interacting with the subendothelial layer and zoom in on it and see how this is happening. So here we got two little cute platelets. Now the platelets, as you can see, they're bound to the collagen lining. So here's our collagen lining. So this is all gonna be the collagen of our subendothelial layer. Now I told you that they're bound to specific special proteins here. What are these proteins? What are these cute little proteins here? These proteins here are called von Wildebrand factor. What are these called? Von Wildebron factor. These are made by platelets. They're also made by injured endothelial cells. So platelets can make this protein because guess why? If they make it, then they have something to bind onto. And if endothelial cells make it, it means that they're probably injured. So cool thing there. Now, not a super special important connection, but I'm going to quickly mention it. Von Wildebron factor does bind with platelets. How? 
well, they don't just bind to the surface of the platelet, they bind via a special receptor. There is a protein here in red that literally kind of interacts with this, and this is called the GP1B protein. So there's a little GP. 1B protein. Again, I don't think it's super clinically relevant, but it's just so that you understand that there is a connection between these two. Now, the platelets, they were not inactivated because of why? There's no nitric oxide, no prostacycline by these damaged endothelial cells. So then the platelets want to stick to the von Wildermann factor via the GP1B. Once they bind, here's what's really cool, they start to become activated in a particular way. Once they become activated, it may trigger these particular platelets to release cytokines. So they have these things called granules. So there's all these different types of granules that are present in the platelets. And these granules contain so many different molecules. But once it becomes activated, it'll secrete all of these particular different molecules to surrounding platelets as kind of like an alarm system. Hey, platelets, there's a lot of things going on here. Get over here. What are some of these molecules? Well, some of them that it may release here is it may release, as I told you, Vaughn. Wildebrand factor to potentiate more interactions between platelets and the actual von Wildebrand factor with the collagen connection. It also can release another protein here called fibrinogen. We'll talk about how that's relevant in a second. It can also release things like calcium, which is involved in the coagulation cascade. But there's really two specific things that I want you to know. One is it releases a very special molecule called ADP. Okay, release a molecule called ADP. Now what's cool about ADP? ADP, adenosine diphosphate, is a very interesting molecule that it likes to go and interact with this specific protein receptor on other platelets. So other nearby platelets. This ADP will come and bind onto this particular receptor. So ADP is going to bind onto this receptor. When it binds onto this receptor, what it's going to do is it's going to stimulate this platelet. And the way that it does this is it does it by various mechanisms, but really it's just going to try to increase the intracellular calcium inside of the actual cell, inside of this platelet. And calcium can lead to a lot of different things that we will talk about in just a second. But that's one very special mechanism. So I'm going to go ahead and put like a little one here, a little one, like a Roman numeral one, that this is one specific target of antiplatelets, okay? So ADP binds onto these ADP receptors. You know what else we call these receptors? We call them P2Y12 receptors. What are they called? P2Y12 receptors. P2Y12 receptors. Now, I'm going to quickly tell you what this actually does. When ADP is released by platelets that bound to the actual von Wildermann factor of this injured vessel, it binds to these receptors, increases intracellular calcium. Now, what does that do? The increase in intracellular calcium is going to activate a couple different things. One is it's going to stimulate the expression of very special receptors on the actual cell membrane of the platelets. What is this receptor here called? This receptor here in pink is called GP2B3A receptors. So these are called GP2B3A receptors or proteins. Now whenever the platelets actually express this particular proteins on their surface, it's a real kind of like connection. Imagine it being like the hands of the platelets trying to grab onto the other platelets nearby. So the platelet becomes activated. It releases this chemical to activate nearby platelets to grow arms and to hook onto it and catch it. And then all it really does is it kind of forms like this whole like plinko or a whole accumulation of platelets that are holding on together to come to this area of where the vessel injury is, the platelet plug formation. Now there is a particular protein that is really bridging this connection, and we already talked about it right here, and it's this one that the platelets are making. Did I tell you about this one? What's this protein here called? This is called fibrinogen. That's called fibrinogen. Your platelets actually make this because they know that they're gonna need it to act as the bridge between them. And so look what kind of sneaks in between here, my friends. Oh, this is so cool, the fibrinogen. The fibrinogen is what allows for the plates to be able to stick with one another and really help to form that platelet plug. That's one of the mechanisms of ADP. The second thing is when you increase calcium, it also will activate the granules to become activated. So it'll stimulate these granules to become activated to fuse with the cell membrane and guess what? Potentiate everything that we just did. In other words, release more von Wildebrand factor to bind here for more platelets to stick to. 
release more fibrinogen so that we have more kind of bridging connections between platelets. Release more calcium so that we have more things necessary for the coagulation cascade. And then release more ADP so that you can go and then stimulate other platelets to come nearby, come to the area of where the injury is, become activated, and then connect with them. Isn't that cool? So, what's really interesting about this is what if I came up with an, one other mechanism? So there's two things so far. One is calcium causes this, it causes this. There's one more thing. Oh, it's cool. In the cell membrane, we have a very special molecule. It's phospholipids, right? Phospholipids make up most of this. But what happens is you have a special enzyme here that becomes activated by calcium. And this is called phospholipase A2. And what phospholipase A2 will do is it'll break down the phospholipids in the actual cell membrane and make something called arachidonic acid. And then arachidonic acid will then get broken down into something called thromboxane A2. Right? It'll get broken down into something called thromboxane A2. Now, thromboxane A2, which is a really cool molecule, can actually get released out of this particular platelet. So it can get released out of the platelet, and then it can go and do all the similar things that ADP does. So in other words, in order for me to do this, calcium becomes active. Calcium causes the activation of this particular enzyme. That then activates the phospholipids to break down arachidonic acid into thromboxane A2. Well, I mean, it breaks it down to phospholipids into arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid gets broken down to thromboxane A2. And the way that thromboxane A2 gets formed from arachidonic acid is another special enzyme. And that enzyme is called the cyclooxygenase enzyme, COX enzyme, keep your minds clear. So we have the COX enzyme, which is important for being able to stimulate the actual breakdown of arachidonic acid into thromboxane A2. And then thromboxane A2 will get released. And I, all I really want you to think about is that thromboxane A2, just so we can write it here, thromboxane A2 acts very similarly to ADP. So thromboxane A2 acts very similarly to ADP. So if you think about it, thromboxane A2, if this was a little site for this one. So let's say here's the thromboxane A2, it gets released. So here's thromboxane A2, it gets released from a platelet, and it binds onto this particular site. It's going to increase the intracellular calcium. If you increase the intracellular calcium, you will cause the increased expression of GP2B3A proteins. You'll cause the activation of the phospholipase A2, which will increase the arachidonic acid pathway to increase thromboxane A2. And third, increase the release of all of these particular different molecules that are important for platelet activation, platelet aggregation, platelet sticking, and formation of the platelet plug. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I think it's pretty stinking cool. There's one more thing though. So we know that with this being said here, that thromboxane A2 can bind onto particular receptors and increase calcium. We know that ADP can bind onto these P2Y12 receptors and increase calcium. So we know that this is a particular mechanism for them, is to increase the calcium. Well, I think what's really important is, is that there's something else that actually controls this. It's cyclic AMP. So there is a molecule present inside of our actual cells here, and this is called cyclic AMP. And what cyclic AMP does is it actually is going to inhibit the increase in calcium. So cyclic AMP will inhibit the increase in calcium. That's an important concept. And so if we have a special enzyme that actually regulates cyclic AMP, that, may, that enzyme may be able to increase the calcium levels. Because if we have increase in cyclic AMP, that's going to decrease the calcium levels. So here's what I want you to think. I actually want you to think about it like this then. So we know that these molecules increase calcium levels. I also want you to associate that cyclic AMP is a molecule that's present in these actual platelets. And if we activate cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP can work to decrease your calcium levels. And so in other words, you won't perform all of these functions. So there's a special enzyme here, and this enzyme is called the phosphodiesterase 3 enzyme. And what this enzyme does is, is it actually is going to specifically break down the actual, so you know phosphodiesterases, they break down cyclic AMP? So this would specifically work to inhibit cyclic AMP. So if I don't have cyclic AMP that's increased, I won't be able to decrease my calcium. Instead, I'll have less cyclic AMP and therefore a increase in calcium. And so I'll still allow for this whole process to occur.
You're probably wondering, Zach, why in the world are you telling me all of these particular things? I got you. If I could come up with a drug to inhibit all of these red specific points here, wouldn't that be pretty cool? I got you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the first one that we mentioned. I'm going to inhibit the P2Y12 receptor. And I can use a lot of different drugs to perform this function here. So some of these drugs would be the most common is clopidogrel. Another one is called prosugrel. Another one is called ticagrelor. And another one, which is not really often used, is called teclopidine. But these are inhibiting what specific receptor? This receptor. So in ADP, which is released from an activated platelet that tries to cause platelet activation, platelet aggregation, platelet sticking, forming the platelet plug, it really is controlled via that receptor. Well, what if I inhibit this particular receptor? Can it cause an increase in the calcium levels? No, it won't be able to trigger the signaling pathway. So I won't be able to increase calcium. I won't be able to express GP2B3A proteins. I won't allow for the platelets to stick with one another. I won't allow for it to release thromboxane A2, which acts just like ADP to increase calcium, cause these receptors to be expressed, and cause cytokine release. Also, if I inhibit the increase in calcium, I won't be able to release things like ADP, calcium, fibrinogen, von Willebrand factor, all of these things that are important for forming the platelet plug. All I gotta do is block that receptor and I inhibit platelet plug formation. Pretty cool, okay. Another thing is, what if I inhibit the cyclooxygenase? So in other words, let's say that the, this platelet becomes activated, it does express the GP2B3A proteins, it does try to release things like ADP and all these other molecules, but it tries to activate this pathway to increase the formation of thromboxane A2, which performs similar functions. What if I inhibited this enzyme? I wouldn't be able to form thromboxane A2. And if I don't form thromboxane A2, so in other words, if I decrease the thromboxane A2, I won't be able to increase intracellular calcium and cause all these three pathways to occur. I won't allow for platelet sticking, platelet activation and aggregation, and then again, that reciprocal cycle to cause platelet plug. So this would be where a drug category such as your COX, so inhibiting the COX enzyme, would be very, very helpful. And this is one particular molecule here, and this is called acetyl salicylic acid, also known as aspirin. Sometimes we abbreviate this ASA which I'll be using a lot. All right, so we understand that, right? So, so far we've inhibited two particular things. We've inhibited the P2Y12 receptor, which inhibits the in increase in intracellular calcium. We inhibited the COX enzyme, which inhibited the thromboxane A2 formation, which will also decrease intracellular calcium. What else could I do? What if I just didn't allow for the platelets to stick with one another? If they can't stick with one another, they really can't form a platelet plug. They can't become truly activated and form a good platelet plug. So what if I just directly inhibit this connection here? Wouldn't that be pretty helpful? Absolutely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inhibit the GP2B3A connection. And that's a really helpful thing. And so there is a couple different drugs that are actually utilized in this particular step. So some of these could be, for example, abciximab. Another one could be tyrofibin. And another one could be eptifibatide. Now, with all of these particular drugs, we've so far gotten to the point that we've actually covered three particular mechanisms to inhibit platelet plug formation. One is block the P2Y12 receptor, inhibit the COX enzyme, inhibit the GP2B3A receptor. So what else? Is there another kind of area that I can actually specifically inhibit? So I've talked about how if I inhibit ADP from binding to the receptors, that inhibits the increase in intracellular calcium. If I inhibit thromboxane A2 formation, that inhibits the intracellular calcium increase. And that's an important concept. I actually want to kind of write that down is that, again, if you inhibit the P2Y12 receptor and you inhibit thromboxane A2 formation, the overarching theme for this is that you're going to lead to a decrease in the GP2B3A production. You're also going to lead to decrease in thromboxane A2 formation and you're also going to lead to decrease in ADP formation. 
all of these things are important, right? Because when we talk about this, all of these are involved in what particular process here? To stimulate the platelet plug because we talked about how all these mechanisms work. Now, that's these two, and then specifically, so this would be the COX enzyme, right, that I'm inhibiting, and this would be the receptor that I'm blocking. And then I could specifically block right here. So if I actually also inhibit the GP2B3A protein, I won't be able to form the platelet plug. There's another uh, specific process here, and that's really kind of like, these are all trying to, you know, generally when you stimulate this receptor or you increase this particular molecule, they increase intracellular calcium to cause this particular process. So really all of this, all of these particular pathways are dependent upon an increase in intracellular calcium. Remember I told you that cyclic AMP decreases intracellular calcium, right? And that's regulated by this enzyme called phosphodiesterase. So phosphodiesterase is on. So let's say that this enzyme is on and inhibits cyclic AMP. Right? It inhibits the cyclic AMP. And if you inhibit cyclic AMP, calcium levels increase. Okay? If I inhibit this enzyme, now this enzyme is off. I'm going to inhibit this enzyme. I can no longer inhibit cyclic AMP. So now cyclic AMP will become stimulated. If it's stimulated, it will lower the intracellular calcium. If I lower the intracellular calcium, my friends, what can I now not do? I can't stimulate the granules, I can't stimulate the GP2B3A receptor proteins, and I can't stimulate thromboxane A2 formation. So all of these things will be inhibited, and I won't be able to potentiate the platelet plug. So this is where you can inhibit the PDE3 enzyme and lead to activation of cyclic AMP, which decreases your intracellular calcium. There's two particular drugs in this category. And this is called diperidamol, diperidamol. And another one is called silostazole, silostazole. Now, when we talk about all of these drugs, I think a really, really important thing to understand is, is that these antiplatelet agents are not breaking a clot down. They're inhibiting clot formation or they're inhibiting clot propagation. And I think that's a really kind of important thing to kind of enunciate here, is that when you're giving these drugs, when you give antiplatelets, they are not going to break a clot down. They're going to inhibit clot formation so that you don't form a clot within your arterial circulation. And they're also going to inhibit clot propagation so that the clot doesn't get any bigger within your arterial circulation. And these antiplatelet agents are more particularly beneficial in the arterial circulation than they are in the venous circulation. Now, there's one last mechanism that goes along with the PDE3 enzyme, and I just have to quickly mention it for completeness sake. In your smooth muscle, so here we have a vascular smooth muscle cell. So here's gonna be the blood vessel that got injured. If I take a piece of the vascular smooth muscle and zoom in on it here, so this is a vascular, smooth muscle cell. There's that enzyme. This is that P, let's actually keep it color coordinated here. This is the enzyme called PDE3. PDE3. This enzyme I told you works specifically in what capacity? Well, normally we have this enzyme here called adenylate cyclase and what it'll do is it'll take ATP, convert that into cyclic AMP, and cyclic AMP will specifically work in a specific process in vascular smooth muscle to inhibit. So really what it's going to do is, is when you kind of work here, cyclic AMP will work to try to be able to activate protein kinases in these particular smooth muscle cells. And what that'll do is it'll actually lead to phosphorylation of specific processes. It'll activate like protein kinases. In this case, it could activate like protein kinase A. And what that's going to try to do is it's going to try to kind of inhibit um, the smooth muscle cells from actually wanting to undergo a, a, a constriction process. So in other words, it inhibits the contraction process. So this will actually be inhibited and it won't undergo contraction or movement of the myofilaments. Well, PDE3 is going to work to specifically inhibit cyclic AMP. So it decreased cyclic AMP, it would decrease the protein kinase A, you would not phosphorylate and it would promote contraction right, of the actual smooth muscle cell. Well, if I give a particular drug like a PDE3 inhibitor, it's going to inhibit this particular enzyme. 
if this enzyme is inhibited, it's no longer going to be able to turn this enzyme off. So now this enzyme is super stimulated. You increase your cyclic AMP, you increase your protein kinase A, and you increase the inhibition of the vascular smooth muscle cell from contracting. What kind of process will that lead to? That'll lead to a relaxation of the smooth muscle and then a vasodilation effect. So that's an important concept that you only see with this drug category here, the PDE3 inhibitor, that it has antiplatelet function and vasodilatory function, which could be beneficial in things like PAD. But we'll talk about that later. Okay, my friends. So at this point, we're trying to give drugs that are going to inhibit the platelet plug, and that is gonna be your antiplatelets. We talked about how they would do that. We inhibit the P2Y12 receptor, which ADP binds to. We inhibit the COX enzyme, which inhibits the thromboxane A2 formation. We inhibit the connection between the platelets that allows for them to stick and form the platelet plug by inhibiting the GP2B3A proteins. We can inhibit the PDE3, which helps to regulate cyclic AMP. If you inhibit it, now the cyclic AMP is on because it's normally supposed to inhibit it, but you're inhibiting that enzyme. So now it's on and it decreases intracellular calcium, which doesn't allow for platelet plug formation. And then when we talk about this, it's important to remember that all of these antiplatelets are working to specifically stop clot formation or inhibit clot propagation. They do not break down clots. And again, one more additional kind of fact here is that we have found that antiplatelets, antiplatelets are going to be more beneficial in inhibiting arterial, and again, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but arterial thromboemboli. Okay, all right, my friends. Let's now move on to the next category here, which is going to be the anticoagulants. Anticoagulants is the next component, and really what they're working to do is inhibit the coagulation cascade. So let's kind of pick up, right? So naturally, we said that the vessels, they naturally have an antithrombotic function. There's many more than what I've mentioned here, um, but obviously nitric oxide is one, um, prostacyclin is another. There's another molecule that's expressed called antithrombin-3, which we will get into a little bit later. But really, when we talk about this, nitric oxide and prostacyclin is trying to inhibit the platelets. Antithrombin-3 is trying to inhibit things like factor two, like thrombin, and, and another one which we'll talk about, factor 10. But either way, these are trying to inhibit the coagulation cascade. So they're trying to prevent us from forming clots when we don't want to, in other words, pathological clots. So we have antithrombotic mechanisms, but the blood vessel becomes injured, can't release nitric oxide, can't release prostacyclin, von Willebrand factor is exposed, platelets say, mm, mm, don't mind if I do, and it binds. And when it binds, it binds, von Willebrand's factor via the GP1B, let's see if you guys remember, becomes activated, releases things like ADP, and when it releases ADP, it binds to the P2Y12 receptor, increases interest of the calcium, increases the expression of what protein for them to stick together, GP2B3A, causes an increase in the release of more ADP, plus it activates the interest of the pathway to increase thromboxin A2, which increases the same thing as ADP, and then on top of that, we also talked about how the PDE3 enzyme is also involved in this process, again, to kind of work specifically to inhibit that from increasing the interest of the calcium. So we talked about all these particular mechanisms, okay? The platelet plug has been formed. We talked about how antiplatelets will work to inhibit that. One's to inhibit the P2Y12 receptor, one to inhibit the COX enzyme, one to inhibit the GP2B3A proteins, and one to inhibit the PDE3 enzyme. The next thing here is once the platelets have formed the platelet plug, they develop a kind of negatively charged surface or an activated surface, if you will. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of like put these negative charges here because now the platelets are activated. Once they are activated, this forms a surface for which the coagulation proteins love. And so this can activate all of these different types of coagulation proteins. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put coagulation proteins. And what these coagulation proteins are gonna do is they're gonna go through this whole vicious cycle that will go through. There's so many different arrows that are involved here, <laughs> all this different concept here. But everything that it leads to is it leads to the formation of something called the fibrin mesh. The ultimate goal is, is to make something called fibrin. And fibrin is this kind of like mesh-like protein that allows for platelets to be nice and cozy and stuck together and stable, and it really helps to stabilize the clot, really help to increase the size of the clot and stabilization of the clot. So what I gotta do is, 
is I gotta come up with ways that I can inhibit some of these coagulation proteins somewhere in this madness of mix to kind of inhibit the formation of fibrin. Because if I don't form fibrin, I won't form the fibrin mesh, I won't kind of form this fibrin coating that stabilizes the clot, increases the size of the clot, all of those things. So now let's get into that. All right, so the first concept here is we have two different pathways. I don't want this to be too intense, guys. Let's not make it intense. Let's make it somewhat simple. We have two pathways. One pathway we'll highlight here. So we're going to have something called the extrinsic pathway. And I'm not going to go through this in crazy depth. I just really kind of want to highlight more of the common pathway, to be honest with you. But there's two pathways. One is called the intrinsic pathway. And the other one is called the extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway is from the platelets. So the platelets, this is usually secondary to the activated platelets. The extrinsic pathway is due to vessel injury. So it's the actual tissue of the vessel wall that is responsible for this. So the activated platelets will activate this pathway and the vessel wall that's injured will activate this pathway. Okay. When we activate the platelets, there's so many different proteins, my friends. I'm gonna make this very straightforward. The first one is factor 12. Factor 12 will be activated by the platelets, so it'll stimulate this factor 12. Then factor 12 will activate factor 11. And then factor 11 will activate something called factor nine. And then factor nine will complex with another molecule called factor eight. And when these two combine, they will converge into something that we'll talk about later called the common pathway. But this is your intrinsic pathway. Your intrinsic pathway starts with factor 12, which is activated by platelets, then factor 11, then factor nine, complex with factor eight, and then moves into something called the common pathway. The extrinsic pathway starts off with the tissues releasing something called tissue factor. Okay, so tissue factor. The tissue factor is also sometimes referred to as factor three. Factor three will then activate something called factor seven. And then you have this complex of factor three and factor seven A that then will converge into this next specific part of the pathway. Okay, and what this will do is, there's a special protein here called factor 10. When these converge onto this particular pathway here, what they do is, they help to take and convert factor 10 into the activated form. They activate factor 10. Now, Factor 10 is the interesting thing because if you notice a concept here is that the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway all converge onto this common part here. So this is where we get into this next thing which is from factor 10 down, we get into something called the common pathway. So what I'm gonna kinda do here is I'm gonna write it about right here generally where we're starting now is we are at the common pathway. So this is basically where the intrinsic and extrinsic kind of converge to stimulate the activation of factor 10. Factor 10, when activated, will then activate something else. Okay, so there's another molecule here called prothrombin. And prothrombin will be converted into something called thrombin. And then thrombin will activate two particular proteins. One is called fibrinogen. And what it'll do is it'll convert this into something called fibrin. And it'll also activate another protein called factor 13. And factor 13, when combined with fibrin, will form something called the fibrin meshwork. And that's all that kind of like orange proteins that I kind of mentioned to you before that really kind of come into play here and stick onto the platelets, help the platelets really, really stick together. So if you remember all the platelets were here, this is really helping to stabilize that clot, increase the size of the clot, really kind of form that stickiness of the clot. Really important kind of process here. 
So if you see here, this is really kind of an in pathway of forming this with a couple specific points. One here is the common pathway and the other one is this bad boy right here. So this is a really important protein right here, factor 10, and another really important one is thrombin. Okay, so let's actually highlight this one. So this is one particular protein which is really important. This is a second protein which is very, very important. There's another one. You know, we have um, a lot of these factors that are kind of mixed within this process. Some are made by the liver, some are made by platelets, some are made by endothelial cells. There's all these different proteins, but the liver ones is really, really, really important to the coagulation cascade. In the liver, the liver is responsible for making special types of proteins, right? It makes coagulation proteins, especially factors two, factor seven, and this is an important one. I kind of want to put like a little asterisk next to this one here. That's one of the ones that we specifically talked about was in the extrinsic pathway. It also makes other factors such as factor nine, factors 10, protein C and protein S. Now, all of these, so factors two, seven, nine, and 10 are procoagulants. They want to induce clots. Protein C and protein S are anticoagulants. They want to actually help to prevent clot formation. We'll talk about their relevance later in adverse effects. But these proteins, when they're made by the liver, they need to be functional. And the only way that they're functional is by the activation by a special enzyme. There's a special enzyme called gamma glutamyl transferase. And it will activate, or I'd say, convert these proteins into their functional forms. If they are not in these functional forms, they won't be able to perform their true actions. And the way that gamma glutamyl transferase does this is it actually has to be in some way worked upon, okay? So what happens is, is there's a special type of enzyme, if you will, um, and it's working on this pathway here. So there's what's called vitamin K, and there is the oxidized form, and then there is vitamin K, the reduced form. Now, <clears throat> what happens is vitamin K in the reduced form will give away electrons onto this gamma glutamyl transferase. And when it does that, in this step, it activates gamma glutamyl transferase. So we need vitamin K to be in this reduced form to activate or be a cofactor. So it's a cofactor into this gamma glutamyl transferase, which will activate these particular proteins, such as factors two, seven, nine, 10, C, and S. So this is this particular step. Now, in order for me to be able to continue this, this has to be a cycle. So I have to convert vitamin K from the oxidized back to the reduced and then continue this particular cycle here. So in other words, vitamin K is very crucial. So how do I keep getting vitamin K to be in the reduced form so that it can donate electrons to gamma glutamyl transferase, keep it activated so it can make my proteins functional, and then when it goes to the oxidized, go back to the reduced form? Great question. There's an enzyme here called vitamin K epoxide reductase. And this enzyme will stimulate this particular step to go from the oxidized to the reduced form. If this enzyme is present, it'll keep the vitamin K reduced, it'll keep the GGT activated, it'll keep it to stimulate these functional proteins such as factors 2, 7, 9, 10 that can be utilized in the coagulation cascades. That's very important, my friends. So now the question that you probably are coming to is, okay, Zach, I know the coagulation cascade now. How in the world is this actually important? This is the third step. The third point in the coagulation cascade that we're gonna target, okay? So in other words, I want to target factor 10. In other words, if I inhibit factor, so if I use this as my first target, this is my first target, I'm going to inhibit factor 10. If I inhibit factor 10, I won't activate thrombin, I won't activate fibrinogen to fibrin, I won't have the fibrin mesh. Because my goal is to really kind of prevent the fibrin mesh from forming. That's the end goal. So one way I can do that is I can inhibit factor 10. <laughs> How am I gonna do that? So if I inhibit factor 10, I can do it a couple different ways. I can do it directly or I can do it indirectly. So let's say that I write these two ways down. So one way that I can inhibit factor 10 
is I can do it indirectly. So I'm going to indirectly inhibit factor 10. How do I do that? How in the world can I do that? Great question. So there's a special molecule that I mentioned a little bit ago over here called antithrombin-3. Antithrombin-3, if you guys remember, works to do something very special. It inhibits factors 10 and it inhibits thrombin. So antithrombin-3 can inhibit factor 10 and it can inhibit thrombin, which is also known as factor two, just so you know. Thrombin is also known as, that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> I didn't mean to have the second room in the world. There was no pun intended there, but just so you know, thrombin is factor two. Okay, it is factor two. So if I were to give a drug that could really work to increase antithrombin three or activate antithrombin three, it'll inhibit factor 10 and then some degree inhibit thrombin. That's pretty cool. I really want to inhibit just factor 10, but I can do this indirectly. How do I do that? There's a couple different drugs, okay? So one of these is called, they're basically all going to be heparin. They're all going to be heparin because heparin will help to be able to stimulate antithrombin three, and that will help to inhibit these particular factors. Now, there's three particular types of heparin. One is there's unfractionated heparin unfractionated heparin. This unfractionated heparin, what I really want you to know is, is when you look at the structure of this son of a gun, it's got kind of like a sugar molecules, like a sugar moiety, and then off of the edge of it, it's got this thing called a glycosaminoglycan. So it's got these two things, it's got like a pentasaccharide, and then it's got a glycosaminoglycan. It's glycosaminoglycan is super, super long, so when it activates antithrombin-3, it works in a way to loop around where this antithrombin-3 now has the capacity to inhibit both of these factors. So when you give unfractionated heparin, I think a super important point to remember here is that that will actually inhibit factors 10 as equal as it would inhibit thrombin. So it's going to inhibit both of these. So you're gonna get an inhibition of both factors 10 and factors two equally due to, why? Due to an increased glycosaminoglycan. The next molecule here is gonna be called low molecular weight heparin. Now low molecular weight heparin similarly has again this kind of like pentasaccharide structure and it has a glycosaminoglycan but it's a lot, a lot smaller. So it's not as long. So it does work to inhibit anti, uh, stimulate antithrombin three which inhibits factors 10 and two but because of its tiny little glycosaminoglycan it can only inhibit factors 10 much more than it can inhibit thrombin. And that's an important point to remember. It's primarily factor 10 inhibition with a very, very little degree of thrombin inhibition. That's pretty cool, right? Now, there is one more type of heparin. It's like a synthetic type. This is called Fonda Paranox, Fonda Paranox. And this one is, again, has no glycosaminoglycan. So it only has like the little baby pentasaccharide kind of structure with no glycosaminoglycan. So there's no chance in this world there's no glycosaminoglycan. So there's no ability to even inhibit like thrombin whatsoever. So because of that, this one only activates antithrombin-3, which inhibits only factor 10, okay? So, so far we've inhibited factor 10. We did it indirectly by increasing antithrombin-3. We did it three particular drugs, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, well, I'm sorry, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and Fonda Paranox. Unfractionated heparin has a long gag. Low molecular weight heparin has a small gag. Fonda Paranox has no gag. The longer the gag is, the more likely you're in to inhibit both thrombin and factor 10. So since unfractionated heparin has a long one, it can inhibit both equally. Since low molecular weight heparin has a small one, it can only primarily inhibit factor 10, less inhibition of factor two or thrombin. And then since the Fonda Paranox has no poor little gag, it can only inhibit factor 10 and not thrombin. Okay, another thing I can do here is I can directly, I can directly inhibit factor 10. So what if I want to directly inhibit factor 10? So this is where I can have a protein that can literally just bind onto factor 10 and render it ineffective. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. So this is what's called your direct oral, direct acting oral anticoagulants. But these are going to be 
These are usually your oral agents. These are usually oral agents. And I love these ones because their names are super cool. So we actually call these DOAX, okay? This is a Pixaban. Look at the name. Look at the name, my friends. Riva Roxaban. A Doxaban. Do you notice something really cool about this that I love? 10A is in there. They directly inhibit factor 10. And these are going to be a Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, a Doxaban. These are the oral agents. Whereas heparin, low molecular weight heparin, Fonda Paranox, these are primarily via like IV or subcutaneous types of injections. This is an oral agent that you can take out patient, you don't have to like inject yourself with. That's really cool. So if I want to inhibit factor 10, I can do this in two particular ways. I can do it indirectly via heparin, or I can do it directly via apixaban, rivaroxaban, and doxaban. And if I do it indirectly, it's because I'm utilizing antithrombin 3. I'm stimulating this particular protein to inhibit these two factors. Unfractionated, 10, 2. Low molecular weight, 10, way more than two. And then Fonda Paranox, primarily only 10 and these only inhibit factor 10 directly. Okay, okay. What if I inhibit thrombin? Is there any way I can do it indirectly? Thank goodness, for the love of goodness, there is not uh, one that we can do indirectly. Thank the Lord. But we can do it directly. So if I wanted to inhibit thrombin, I can do this directly, and that's the primary way. So the primary way that we're gonna do this is directly. And so that means I have to have some special drug that can actually inhibit thrombin. So directly. And again, the cool thing about these drug categories is they are oral. Okay, there is an oral, I actually should be very careful. There's oral and there's IV versions of this. Okay, so with the direct ones, okay, they're going to, again, if we think about this, we think about the kind of these drugs here, they're specifically working via antithrombin three, if it's all these heparins to inhibit factor 10, or these ones directly to inhibit factor 10. You get less 10A, less thrombin, less fibrinogen to less fibrin, and less of the fibrin mesh. If we inhibit thrombin directly, we get less thrombin activation, less fibrin, less of the fibrin mesh. What are the drugs in this category? For the oral ones and then the IV ones. So the oral one is going to be something called dabigatran. So dabigatran. This is the PO version. The IV versions are going to be something called Argatraban, Argatraban, and another one is called Bivalarudin, Bivalarudin. These are the IV version, and really their name to fame, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is in something called um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Okay, my friends. So at this point, we've covered ways that we can inhibit these two particular processes. One is inhibiting factor 10. One is inhibiting thrombin. What did I tell you was the third mechanism? Inhibiting the vitamin K epoxide reductase. <laughs> if I inhibit the vitamin K epoxide reductase, we actually call these categories, we call this vitamin K antagonists. Vitamin K antagonists, because we're inhibiting the vitamin K epoxide reductase. If we inhibit the vitamin K epoxide reductase, we don't reduce the vitamin K. We don't have the vitamin K in the reduced form to activate the GGT. The GGT is inhibited. If the GGT is inhibited, it cannot make functional clotting proteins. If these are not functional clotting proteins, such as factor seven and 10, you won't be able to allow for them to activate factor 10 and then lead to thrombin activation, fibrin and fibrin mesh. Isn't that cool? So the primary drug in this particular category, my friends, is called warfarin. This is called warfarin. Okay, my friends, so at this point, we have covered all the ways that we can stop the coagulation cascade because if I give anticoagulants, I'm just gonna put here AC, what are they doing? They're working to inhibit the fibrin mesh. If I inhibit the fibrin mesh, I inhibit what? Do I break down the clot for me? I don't break down clots, that's super critical to remember. You do not break down clots. You decrease the fibrin mesh. And if you decrease the fibrin mesh, that gives you two kind of like processes that occur here. Let's actually make some room so that we can write that. There's two primary things that come as a benefit to that. One, 
is you decrease clot formation, and second, you decrease clot propagation. You do not break down clots. And the clots that it's primarily working on is both venous and arterial thromboemboli. All right, my friends? Okay, so at this point, we've covered antiplatelets, we've covered anticoagulants. We got one more phase, that's thrombolytics. Let's hit it. All right, my friends, fibrinolysis. So at this point, now we're kind of at the third phase is where thrombolytics comes into play. I think it really kind of makes sense when you hit these back to back. It's obviously gonna be a behemoth of a video, and I really am sorry that it's so long. I just think that it's gonna be helpful as one kind of inclusive video to really help your understanding and knowledge. But anyway, we talk about it, vessel gets injured. So again, we talked about how naturally we release things like nitric oxide, we release things like prostacyclin, we have things like antithrombin-3. And again, we talked about how these are like your natural kind of like antiplatelet mechanisms, which is specifically this one, it's inhibiting platelets. We talked about how antithrombin-3 is going to inhibit things like factors 10 and thrombin, and there's other molecules out there. We didn't talk about it, we briefly mentioned it, but you also have things like protein C and protein S, and these are also inhibiting other particular like procoagulants. So you have natural kind of like antithrombotic mechanisms. But let's say that you, again, you have a vessel injury, platelets stick to the von Willebrand factor, they release things like ADP, thromboxane A2, right? They also increase the expression of things called GP2B3A proteins, which allows for the platelets to stick with one another. We have drugs that inhibit that process. We have the PTY12 receptor blockers. We have the COX enzyme inhibitor. We have the GP2B3A protein receptor blockers, and we have the PDE3 inhibitors. Then we had the coagulation cascade that occurred. And the coagulation cascade well, it led to the formation of the fibrin, mesh, which helps to kind of really stabilize the clot, increase clot formation, increase clot propagation, and really kind of allow for the platelets to stick with one another and really form a stable forming clot. And that was the fibrin mesh, and that was carried out by the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway and some of the clotting proteins from the liver. And we talked about how we had drugs that could block specific factors in the coagulation cascade, factor 10 inhibitors, whether it be indirect, such as the heparin via antithrombin 3, or direct, such as the rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban. Then we said we have ones that we can inhibit thrombin directly, or factor two. And we said that that would be dabigatran, argatraban, bivalirudin. And then we had the other ones that we could inhibit the vitamin K epoxide reductase, so it doesn't activate GGT, doesn't make functional proteins like 2, 7, 9, 10, C, and S. And so then they can't be utilized to make fibrin mesh. And that would have been warfarin. So we talked about all these different drugs along the way. Well, now we move into fibrinolysis. So, you know, there's kind of a balance. When you form a clot, you want to have the fibrin mesh and then you have, want to have something called fibrinolysis, right? Because it's, it's a natural type of process. And so we have another kind of like anti, I don't know, clot mechanism, if you will. And it's really interesting. So I'm going to zoom in on that anti-clot mechanism. So basically what it would do is it would take, you're going to have like some special type of process here where it'll break down the fibrin and the connection between the platelets. And so essentially you would kind of dissolve the clot in a way. So what you would kind of see here is you would see kind of a dissolution of the clot, an actual true breakdown of the clot. How does that happen? So we have a molecule here called plasminogen. There's a molecule here called plasminogen. And plasminogen is naturally um, a very interesting enzyme that it can be converted into something called plasmin. So it can be converted into something called plasmin. And plasmin is interesting in, this, in the concept that it can actually break down two particular molecules. So remember I told you that there was a molecule called fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is you know, generally utilized to synthesize something called fibrin. So we utilize this to make something called fibrin. Well, when plasminogen is converted into plasmin, it can break down fibrinogen and break it down into something called like fibrinogen degradation products. And it can break down fibrin into fibrin degradation products. And it can even break some of this back down into fibrinogen. So this is kind of what you get here when you have plasmin. So plasmin is really helping to break down the fibrinogen and the fibrin and break them in down into the, these fibrin degradation products so that you can do what? 
will essentially dissolve the clot. So the ultimate concept here is when you're giving these particular drugs that works via this pathway, what you're seeing with kind of this fibrinolytic pathway is that fibrinolysis leads to a decrease in the fibrin formation and a decrease in the fibrinogen. This leads to a decrease in the clot size, so you're going to actually break down the clot, and this decreases the, what is fibrinogen used for? <laughs> this is what's really cool, and I actually never knew this until recently. When you think about why it actually breaks down the clot, well, we can break down the fibrin mesh, but how do we actually kind of break up the platelets? This is to a smaller degree, so if you really look at this, kind of this process here, this is the more potent effect here for the fibrin breakdown, but there is a small fibrinogen breakdown as well. Fibrinogen is that protein that was connecting between platelets and forming the platelet plug, the actual activation, the connection, the arm holding between the platelets. And so this was actually utilized, the fibrinogen. So the fibrinogen was kind of incorporated into this connection here. So it helped to be able to um, kind of stimulate the platelet plug, if you will. And so if we break down fibrinogen, we don't have as much fibrinogen to allow for the platelets to stick with one another. And so it actually can cause platelet dissolution or platelet kind of separation. And so it can actually decrease the platelets, platelet connection or the plug, if you will. And I think that's really cool about this is that in comparison to antiplatelets, and into anticoagulants, those potentially help to stop clot formation, prevent clot propagation. This actually breaks down clots. So when you think about this fibrinolysis and the true concept of the name here is that when you think about this concept here, where you're actually decreasing the clot formation or you're decreasing the clot actually like stabilization and you're decreasing the platelet plug, this is truly essentially breaking the clot up breaks clots or clot busting. That is extremely kind of critical to understand. So I think what really comes into play here is if I really wanted to break down clots, I want to enhance, I want to increase my fibrinolytic pathway so that I can break down clots and break down the platelet connection and really help to dissolve the clot in pathological situations. So that leads to me to the question here, which is how in the world is this plasminogen to plasmin formation occurring? This is occurring via something called tissue plasminogen activator. So tissue plasminogen activator will stimulate plasminogen into plasmin. If I increase plasmin formation, I increase the breakdown of fibrinogen. So I'm actually going to continue to increase the breakdown of fibrinogen, decreasing fibrinogen, and I'm going to decrease my fibrin by breaking that down as well. And I'll lead to the dissolution of the clot. So I need drugs that are going to either stimulate TPA or act like TPA. How do I do that? <laughs> That's where we get into these drugs, which are going to basically kind of increase your TPA. And so there's a lot of drugs that actually act like tissue plasminogen activator. The most commonly utilized one here is going to be something called Altaplace. So Altaplace, there's another one, which is kind of like recombinant TPAs, and this would be things like Retaplace and Tenecteplase. There's other ones which are kind of like weirdly synthesized, so you have something called like Eurokinase, and there's other ones like Streptokinase as well. So there's another one here called Streptokinase. I'd say out of all of these, the most commonly utilized one here, so these are called, these are your recombinant TPAs. This is actually going to be like true TPA. This is like true TPA. And this is gonna be the most commonly utilized ones. These are kind of like weird molecules, which I would actually be very, very careful with ever utilizing. But I think the concept that I want you guys to think about here is with the three phases of hemostasis, we have platelet plug, we get antiplatelets for that. Coagulation cascade, we give anticoagulants for that. Fibrinolysis, we give thrombolytics for that phase. And so now we understand here that if we do enhance the fibrinolysis process, in other words, we increase TPA, so we activate this enzyme or we increase this enzyme or we increase this enzyme, we're going to allow for an increase in the plasmin, a decrease in the fibrinogen, so we have less ability to be able to, so we have less fibrinogen, we have less of the platelet plug, 
and we'll have more of these fibrin degradation products. If we decrease fibrin, we don't have any kind of fibrin present to allow for the formation and stabilization of the clot. So we'll increase these fibrin degradation products and we'll, again, we'll actually help to decrease the amount of clot present, decrease the platelet plug, and we'll help to enhance the breaking down or dissolution of the clots. Isn't that a cool concept? I think it is. But that's really what I want you guys to obtain out of all of these mechanisms of action related to the physiology. Now this was a lot. So what I want to do is I want to quickly test your knowledge and just hit a couple big points. Which one blocks this? Which one blocks this? Which one stimulates this? And see if you guys can remember. And then we'll go on to indications of why we utilize these drugs. All right, my friends. So real quick, if we're trying to stop or inhibit or decrease the platelet plug, we had a lot of different drugs that we kind of mentioned kind of within this physiological process. We could inhibit the P2Y12 receptor. This was the clopidogrel, the prosugrel, the ticagrelor, the diclopidine. This was inhibiting the platelet plug. All of these things are gonna be working to decrease intracellular calcium, decreasing the expression of GB2B3A proteins, decrease the release of other molecules such as ADP and von Willebrand factor, all of those concepts. We also had another way that we could do this, which is inhibiting special enzymes that synthesize thromboxane A2. This was via the arachidonic acid pathway. So we take arachidonic acid and we utilize this via the COX enzyme to synthesize this protein. If we utilize a special kind of like a drug to inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme, if we inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme, then what will we do? We'll decrease the thromboxane A2 and we won't allow for the stimulation of the platelet plug. What if we gave drugs that inhibited the GP2B3A connection? So now you can't allow for this connection to occur. So the platelets won't be able to stick with one another and truly form a platelet plug. And therefore you will inhibit the formation of a platelet plug. And then lastly, we said that we can inhibit this special enzyme that also is important for regulating calcium levels. And this was the PDE3 inhibitors as well. So we could do these to inhibit these special enzymes. They're naturally supposed to do what? Turn off the cyclic AMP. If they can't turn off the cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP will do what to the calcium levels? Plummet them. You can't express the GP2B3A proteins, you can't release thromboxane A2, and you can't release ADP to trigger this whole process. That's the drugs in this category. Next thing is if we wanted to use drugs to specifically inhibit what specific enzyme in this process that makes functional, factor 2, 7, 9, 10, C, and S, we have to inhibit this enzyme. What's this enzyme here? Vitamin K epoxide reductase. Which drug does this one? Warfarin. If we want to increase the production of antithrombin 3 to inhibit factors 10 and antithrombin, I'm sorry, thrombin, there, these were the heparin molecules. And so there was the different types of heparin. Unfractionated does which ones? This and this one. Low molecular weight does this one, not as much this one. Fonda Paranox does primarily this one. Okay, so again, unfractionated heparin inhibits both. Low molecular weight heparin, primarily 10, a little bit of thrombin, and then Fonda Paranox, primarily 10. If I also wanted to directly inhibit factor 10, I can do that, which way? What's the drugs again? Adoxaban, Apixaban, Rivaroxaban. If I wanted to inhibit thrombin directly, I could do it PO, Dabigatran, or IV, Argatraban by Valerudin. Man, we're good. And then lastly, if I wanted to cause fibrinolysis to be enhanced, I would want to activate this particular enzyme to increase the presence of this enzyme to increase plasminogen into plasmin and plasmin to break down fibrinogen and to break down fibrin so that I don't form a stable clot. But also if I break down fibrin, I can't have fibrin holding the platelets together. And if I break down fibrinogen, I can't keep the platelets connected so the clot will dissolve. Antiplatelets, anticoagulants, decreased clot formation, clot propagation, thrombolytics, break down and dissolve a clot. Okay, my friends, let's go into indications. All right, my friends, so now we're gonna talk about why do we use antiplatelets, anticoagulants, or thrombolytics. So I think the reason why it's nice to kind of combine all of these together is that sometimes all three of these, maybe two of the drug categories, may be utilized in one particular disease. So let's see how they're utilized. And again, I think it's really important to not forget, guys. Anticoagulants, antiplatelets are not busting up a clot. They're inhibiting clot formation. They're inhibiting clot propagation particularly antiplatelets, more in the arterial circulation, whereas anticoagulants, more in the venous, but also in the arterial circulation as well, whereas thrombolytics, they're actually breaking down a clot, an acute clot. All right, first one. 
What would be some neurological indications for some of these drug categories? Well, the first one that I want you guys to think about is acute ischemic stroke. So if a patient develops an acute ischemic stroke of any particular etiology, um, in general, what we want to think about is what is their kind of last known well, right? So we're not going to go crazy down this path of physiology, but if a patient has an acute ischemic stroke, there is a clot forming there. And this is actually leading to decreased oxygen delivery to the brain. If there is decreased oxygen delivery to the actual brain, this is going to lead to ischemia and subsequently infarcts of the brain tissue. And so we don't want that. And so it's important to establish the time frame. When was the last known well? If this is between three and like four and a half hours, this is a time where the clot is relatively fresh and increasing fibrinolysis is the best case scenario here. And so as long as they do not have any particular contraindications, which we'll talk about a little bit later, this would be an indication for thrombolytics. Thrombolytics. So examples is TPA. Okay, that would be one particular indication there. So I want you to think about that. When a patient comes in with an acute ischemic stroke, within that time frame, you should give them TPA. Now, other situations such as anticoagulants, antiplatelets, those could potentially be utilized, but again, they're more for the prevention of a lot of the atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases. So what we could do is if a patient has like a plaque within their vessel wall and you wanna prevent further clot formation and propagation within that actual vessel, we could consider adding on afterwards antiplatelets. So usually acutely, and I can't kind of stress this enough, acutely we're gonna be giving thrombolytics. But in more of kind of the afterwards situation, so, and what I mean is kind of reducing the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we could add on something such as aspirin. So I remember I told you that's acetosalicylic acid, plus or minus a P2Y12 receptor inhibitor, such as clopidogrel. Oftentimes, this is what we would continue for the patient to reduce their risk of further kind of like plaque formation. So in other words, if they have a vessel plaque within their arterial system, like the middle cerebral artery, and they rupture that plaque, they're at risk of forming a platelet plug on top of that. If I can prevent that platelet plug from forming on top of the plaque, I may reduce the risk of developing another acute ischemic stroke. So this is more of a kind of a preventative measure. So this is usually going to be more of a chronic type of utilization, okay, to pre for preventing, again, reducing the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease to reduce the event of another TIA or another CVA. Okay, next indication here is if someone has a clot, but it's not in the arterial circulation, it's in the actual venous circulation of the brain. So we call this a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So this is basically a DVT of the brain is essentially what it is. So remember I told you antiplatelets aren't really good for venous thromboemboli, so get them out of there. Anticoagulants, that's actually perfect because they're for venous and arterial. TPA, I wouldn't say that that's a true indication in this particular scenario. So anticoagulants are actually going to be your best bet. So that leads into the question is, okay, which one do I pick, right? So oftentimes we start with a heparin infusion or, or some type of heparin as the initial therapy. So this is usually going to be the initial therapy that we'll start off with. And this could be um, unfractionated heparin uh, versus low molecular weight heparin. It really kind of depends. Now, after you've done that, then you, what you do is you switch them over to one of the either the, the, 10 a, the 10 inhibitors, so the direct 10 a inhibitors, or the thrombin inhibitors, or warfarin. And so from there, it's a transition. So after you do a heparin initially, then you transition into the following. So you could do a 10 a inhibitor, so we usually just call these DOACs. So this is going to be your 10, inhib 10 a inhibitors, and this also could be your thrombin inhibitors. So in other words, this could be a Pixaban, a Doxaban, a Rivaroxaban, a Dabigatran, or you could do, or you could do Warfarin. So this is generally how we'll do it. So we'll start the patient off when they have, they find this clot within the venous circulation. We'll start them off on heparin, one of the two. Sometimes if they have cancer, low molecular weight heparin may be a little bit more superior, 
and then afterwards we'll transition them into one of these for long-term management. Okay, generally like Warfarin, if you're kind of looking at preferences, there's a lot of different reasons of why we would pick one over the other, but oftentimes maybe Warfarin requires more monitoring, higher bleeding risk, but it may be more beneficial if the patient has antiphospholipid syndrome. So that may be something to remember. So better in antiphospholipid syndrome in comparison to DOAX. Nonetheless, it's the same concept. You're using anticoagulation. Heparin initially because it's easy to monitor and then transitioning them over to a regular anticoagulant that they can take at home orally. Warfarin or any of the DOACs, whether it be 10A or 2A inhibitors. Okay, we talked about the neurological events of why we would use these. We should understand why we would use this one. Okay, now let's move into the next situation, which is cardiac events. What will be indications of you know, particular cardiac etiologies and which agents would we choose? All right, my friends, so now we talk about cardiac events. So a patient has acute ischemic stroke, they come in, thrombolytics are best, because you gotta bust open that clot. You don't want them to have a time period where they're not getting blood to their brain. They'll develop large infarctions. So thrombolytics acutely. Chronically, long-term, as you're gonna try to continue to reduce the risk of plot, you know, clot propagation, clot formation on top of a pre-existing plaque, especially if they have a lot of atherosclerosis in their uh, cerebral vessels, if you give them aspirin plus or minus a P2Y12, well, P2Y12 receptor blocker, that will again help to potentially reduce the risk of forming a clot on top of that plaque, and again, increasing the risk of them developing a TIA or a stroke, or reducing the risk of them developing a TIA or stroke. Cerebral uh, uh, venous sinus thrombosis, on the other hand, that's a venous clot. Those can cause strokes or bleeds. It's important to remember, though, that they will not respond to antiplatelets, and thrombolytics is very risky with these patient populations. So, because of that, it's best to do anticoagulants to help to prevent further clot propagation, further clot formation, and allow for the clot to dissolve and break down over time. Okay, it won't happen acutely once you start the anticoagulants. But heparin, transition them over to a DOAC or warfarin. All right, cardiac events. So the first one that I want you to remember that's extremely important is acute coronary syndrome. So this includes your unstable angina, this includes your NSTEMI, this includes your STEMI patients. Patient comes in with any of these features of acute coronary syndrome, oftentimes we should think about, okay, it's an arterial clot. Antiplatelets, right? Yes. So what we'll start off with first is, we'll start with adding aspirin. So we'll do both antiplatelets, believe it or not. Both of these are gonna be very, very beneficial. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll add on aspirin. And we'll add on a P2Y12 receptor blocker, okay? So this is gonna be the antiplatelets that we'll give right away when the patient comes in through the door and they have an acute coronary syndrome. The second thing that we'll do here is, if there is the plans for the patient to actually go to um, specifically get a percutaneous intervention. In other words, they're gonna go in, they're gonna put a catheter through the coronary vessels, they're gonna look at them, and they're gonna stent or kind of balloon open the vessel and place a stent. If that is the case, you can consider another antiplatelet agent, but usually in very, very high risk patients. So this would be first situation, right when the patient comes in through the door. Second thing to add on is it's a plus or minus. Let's actually make this a plus or minus. So plus or minus is going to be a GP2B3A inhibitor. This is only prior to PCI. And this is, uh, let's actually write this as kind of like a little thing underneath it. Very high risk patients. Very, very high risk patients. In other words, patients greater than 75, they have diabetes, they have left ventricular dysfunction, they have massively increased troponin levels. These are things to consider in that patient population. Just got to be very careful because now they have an increased risk of bleeding if you add this drug on. All right, so this is going to be the first one. Add on aspirin, add on a P2Y12 receptor blocker, usually a load. Then you can consider this one if the patient is extremely high risk and they're getting ready to go to PCI. Another thing that you add on here, and this is what's interesting, right? It seems like there's a lot, but it, this is what it would be best here. So then you'll add on another drug, which is going to be, if they're going to PCI, we'll add on a anticoagulant. So this is where you prefer heparin, okay? Heparin is usually gonna be the preferred. So unfractionated heparin is actually gonna be the easiest to titrate. You can actually monitor the levels. So usually unfractionated heparin is going to be the preferred agent in this situation. And again, this is going to be prior to PCI and then during PCI. So prior and during PCI. So this is usually for those patients who are going to get a PCI. Okay, 
So we'll start off with aspirin and a P2Y12 receptor blocker, plus or minus a GP2B3A inhibitor if the patient's high risk, and then we'll add on an anticoagulant like heparin for PCI. Now, after they go in, they actually kind of like stent open the vessel, place a stent in there present, then what you can do is, after PCI, you can continue aspirin and this P2Y12 receptor blocker for 12 months, and then you downgrade to aspirin. So here's what we're gonna do now. So what I want you to remember is, post, so we'll put here, post stent. So they have a stent placed into their coronary vessel after they've actually been treated. This you'll do aspirin and a P2Y12 receptor inhibitor. You'll do this for 12 months. And then what you'll do is you'll downgrade to just aspirin after that lifelong or a P2Y12 receptor inhibitor lifelong. Okay, so this is gonna be post stent. So again, when we're talking about this acute coronary syndromes, first thing that we're gonna do is give them aspirin and do a P2Y12 receptor blocker inhibitor load. Second thing that you can consider is a plus or minus if they're high risk for GP2B3A inhibitors. Third is anticoagulate them with heparin if they're gonna to go to the cath lab. The fourth thing is after if they come out of the cath lab, you wanna to continue to prevent stent thrombosis so you continue aspirin and P2Y12 receptor blockers for at least 12 months, and then you downgrade to just one of them lifelong. There's one more particular situ situation here. You can consider one other drug to be given in this situation. And this is usually if the patient is uh, not gonna be getting PCI, they're far away from a PCI uh, capable facility, you can consider something called thrombolytics. It's not gonna be the most superior situation here, but you can consider thrombolytics, such as TPA, if very kind of like far from a PCI capable facility. And to be honest with you, far from PCI capable facility, to be honest with you, even if the patient does get TPA, Right? So a patient comes in, they're less than 12 hours. Generally, that's the only time that we'll give the thrombolytics for a patient who has a active STEMI. So this is preferably for STEMIs. So for a STEMI that is gonna be less than 12 hours, you can give TPA to this patient, right? But again, usually you try to get them to the cath lab for PCI. If they are not a PCI capable facility or they're very, very far from a PCI capable facility, you can give them TPA, but still send them to the closest cath lab that you can so that they can still get a cath uh, done for these patients. So again, just so we're clear, because there's a lot going on here, okay? Patient comes in with an acute coronary syndrome, so unstable angina and STEMI, STEMI. All of them are gonna get kind of an aspirin, and a clopidogrel load, or a P2Y12 receptor blocker inhibitor load. After that, if they are gonna be going to the cath lab and they're very high risk, so in other words, they're diabetic, greater than 75, they have left ventricular dysfunction, massively increased troponin, you load them up with a GP2B3A inhibitor, okay? If the patient's, again, going to cath, you want to prevent them from kind of causing any catheter thrombosis or any complications there, so you anticoagulate them with heparin. After they come out of the cath lab and they have the stent placed, after they've had the angioplasty and stent done, then you continue aspirin and clopidogrel for 12 months and then downgrade to just one or the other lifelong for prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And then lastly, is if the patient comes to the hospital with a STEMI, so it's the specific type of acute coronary syndrome, with a STEMI less than 12 hours of onset, and they are not at a PCI-capable facility or they're very far away from a PCI-capable facility, you can give them TPA. Now, don't give them TPA plus all this other crap, okay? You don't wanna give them this. You will kill them. You'll probably make them bleed massively. So if they are coming in and they are not at a PCI-capable facility or they're very far from one, you can give them thrombolytics, okay? And then get them to the closest PCI-capable facility as you can afterwards. Okay, that's acute coronary syndrome. The next situation here is if a patient has atrial fibrillation, all right? So if a patient has atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation, the problem with atrial fibrillation is these patients are at very high risk of uh, embolic phenomenon, okay? In other words, they have 
some kind of inadequate kind of quivering contraction of their atria, so they don't allow for adequate contraction of the atria, and so there's a stasis of blood flow and you can form left atrial thrombi. So you see the son of a gun right here? This is a left atrial thrombus. The fear is flicking off a piece of that embolus, and that goes up to your cerebral circulation, you end up with a stroke, to your kidney, you end up with a renal infarct, to your liver, you end up with an hepatic infarct, to your kidneys, you, end up, you see what I'm saying, you get the point that it can cause a lot of complications, a lot of embolic phenomenon. So I want to reduce the risk of forming clots on the actual left atrium, and then again, prevent clot propagation, which would increase the risk of emboli. So how do I do that? Well, in this situation here, you'd be like, oh, it's an arterial circulation, antiplatelets would be good. No, not necessarily. You could do antiplatelets, but they haven't been shown to be beneficial. It's usually kind of aspirin as the last line if the patient has all contraindications to anticoagulants. Believe it or not, anticoagulants are the best in this particular scenario. So what we would do in this particular situation here is we would start the patient, if they're in the hospital, we would start them on something like heparin. Okay, this is usually initially. And the reason why is if we're going to start this, it kind of gets us a little bit kind of a better monitoring system of these patients and we can bridge them. So we'll start off with heparin. This could be again unfractionated heparin or it could be low molecular weight heparin. And then what you're going to do is after you start them off on this, so this will be kind of your initial beginning point with the heparin, then what you'll do is you'll transition them. Just as we talked about before in the cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis. Transition them to one of the following. Okay. If they have valvular valvular AFib. This is the easiest way of kind of like branching them apart. In other words, they have mitral stenosis or they have a prosthetic valve, a, a, a mechanical prosthetic valve. These patients cannot get DOAX. It's not FDA approved. It's not been shown to be beneficial. So for these patient populations, you go with warfarin. You go with warfarin. If the patient has non-valvular AFib, non-valvular AFib, in other words, they do not have severe mitral stenosis, they do not have a mechanical prosthetic valve, you can do either or. You can do a DOAC versus warfarin. It really just kind of depends on their underlying kind of comorbidity. So in other words, if you pick a pixaban, rivaroxaban, adoxaban, and a bigotran, if they have renal dysfunction, that can increase their levels and increase the risk of bleeding. So warfarin may be more beneficial. It kind of, again, it kind of just depends. But this is the way that we should look at this for atrial fibrillation. A patient comes into the hospital, they're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. You can start them off, this is an option, you can start them off with heparin, initially get them therapeutic, and then once you get them therapeutic, you can transition them over to a, a oral anticoagulant for lifelong. So warfarin if they have valvular AFib, and you can do a DOAC versus warfarin for non-valvular AFib, okay? But again, the whole point is to reduce the risk of forming kind of emboli that'll go all over the place and cause things like strokes. Okay, oftentimes this is usually when it's found and that's why you often start off with heparin because the patient's in the hospital because they develop a stroke or they develop an acute limb ischemia or they develop a renal infarct or something to that effect. So it's important to be able to remember that. All right, so this is for atrial fibrillation, okay? Next thing is what if a patient has a thrombus in their left ventricle? Maybe they just had an MI, right? Maybe they just had an MI or maybe they have a reduced ejection fraction. So maybe they have like an MI, or maybe they have a very, very reduced ejection fraction. There's a lot of blood pooling up in that area. This can lead to a left ventricular thrombus. So there's one particular thing here. All right, so left ventricular th thrombus. But here's the other concept here. These valves here, mechanical valves, if a patient has a mechanical prosthetic valve, they're very, very susceptible to forming clots, very susceptible. So if a patient has a mechanical prosthetic valve, so if they have a mechanical, mechanical prosthetic valve, these are super thrombogenic. And again, the complications of having a left ventricular thrombus or mechanical prosthetic valve is that you can form thrombi either in the ventricle or on the valves and break little pieces of these clots off and then they can go and embolize all over the place. Brain causes stroke, spine causes you know, some type of anterior spinal artery syndrome, the leg causes acute ischemia, ischemia, you get the point. So with these patients who have a left ventricular thrombus, again, if they're in the hospital, this is why heparin is usually most beneficial in an inpatient setting or as a bridge, especially in patients who are taking warfarin, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we can start off with heparin. 
This is usually initially, and again, I would want to emphasize that this is, you don't have to start with heparin. If a patient has atrial fibrillation and you think that they're at high risk, you can start them off right away on warfarin or a DOAC, okay? If a patient has, again, some type of situation up here where you want to start them off, you don't want to start them on heparin, you can start them right again on a DOAC, uh, whether it be a 10A or thrombin inhibitor or warfarin. It's just oftentimes more beneficial if they're in the hospital and you can get some frequent monitoring to get them to therapeutic levels and then transition them over. So we start them off with heparin again. This could be unfractionated heparin. This could be low molecular weight heparin. And then what you're going to do is you're going to get them therapeutic, especially when you take warfarin. I'll explain why later, I promise. Then you're going to transition. And when you transition, you transition to, again, a DOAC. So again, this is gonna be one of the 10A inhibitors, the thrombin inhibitors, or you can transfer over to warfarin. Again, it just depends on the patient. So the same concept with the mechanical prosthetic valve. Again, if the patient's in the hospital, they just had the prosthetic valve placed, it's often optimal to start them off on heparin, get them kind of therapeutic initially. And then once you've kind of gotten that started and you've had a chance to monitor them, again, whether it be unfractionated heparin, whether it be low molecular weight heparin, whichever one, here's where it's interesting. Because it's a mechanical prosthetic valve, what did I tell you for valvular AFib? You only use warfarin. For a mechanical prosthetic valve, you only use warfarin. So you don't transition them over to a DOAC. You transition them to, here's what's really interesting, warfarin, and then here's one more. There was some recent literature that showed that adding on aspirin, as long as the patient can tolerate it, also significantly reduced thromboembolic complications in patients who have mechanical prosthetic valves. Okay. So acute coronary syndrome, antiplatelets, aspirin, P2Y12 receptor uh, blocker, inhibitor, or inhibitor, load them up with that first. If they're at a PCI-capable facility and they're high risk, GP2B3A inhibitor. If they're at a PCI-capable facility, start them, and they're gonna be going to PCI, give them a heparin load, and then start them on that kind of infusion there. After they've had the stent placed and they've gone to PCI, they completed the procedure, they had the stent, give them aspirin and P2Y12 receptor blocker for 12 months, and then only one of those for lifelong. If they are not at a PCI-capable facility, don't hit them with all this wrecking crap, you'll kill them. <laughs> Just start off, if they're STEMI, less than 12 hours, you start them off with TPA and then get them to a PCI-capable facility as soon as you possibly can. That's the ideal goal, as long as it's less than 12 hours. AFib, you're gonna anticoagulate these patients. Left ventricular thrombus, mechanical prosthetic valve, you're gonna anticoagulate these patients. It may be beneficial to start off with heparin if they're in the inpatient setting or you need to bridge them over to warfarin, and I'll talk about why later unfractionated, low molecular weight, doesn't really matter, and then bridge them over. If it's AFib, valvular, warfarin. Non-valvular, warfarin or DOAC. Left ventricular thrombus, DOAC or warfarin. Mechanical, only transitioning to warfarin plus aspirin. Okay, my friends, let's now move on to the pulmonary complications that we can treat. For pulmonary emboli, this is primarily, again, indication for these, or the particular reasons why we would, uh, drugs that we would get for this situation, is going to be anticoagulants and thrombolytics. And the indications of why we would give one over the other is similarly. So for example, for acute ischemic stroke, we gave thrombolytics if the patient was in the time window. In other words, if a patient came at five hours, I'm not going to give them thrombolytics. They'll just get aspirin, and they'll get a P2Y12 receptor blocker, and we'll treat their underlying cause. If a patient comes in with a STEMI and it's greater than 12 hours, I'm not going to give them a thrombolytic, okay? In the same situation here, pulmonary embolism, it's not necessarily time, it's hemodynamic stability. So if a patient has a pulmonary embolism, one of the things that we have to automatically kind of figure out here is, is the patient hemodynamically stable or are they hemodynamically unstable? If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, and what does that mean? That means that they are hypotensive, tachycardic, kind of features like that. So if a patient has specifically very, very low blood pressure, so hypotensive, maybe they're super, super tachycardic or bradycardic, it really kind of depends, and maybe they're also even hypoxic, and they also have right ventricular dysfunction due to a lot of the stress on the right ventricle from this big, big kind of like clot in the pulmonary circulation, this is a patient who needs to get thrombolytics. You can't wait, you gotta break this clot down. Preventing clot formation and continual clot propagation is not going to be helpful for this patient. We gotta break this puppy down. And so in this scenario, if they are hemodynamically stable, we are gonna do thrombolytics. So this would be an indication for your thrombolytics. For example, again, your TPA molecules. Okay, so it's not a time factor, as we talked about with an acute ischemic stroke, or for um, a STEMI, 
and PCI capable capabilities, it's dependent upon the hemodynamics of the patient. If they're hemodynamically unstable, thrombolytics as long as they don't have a contraindication. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, then we don't really need to rush to break the clot up because in this we are going to clot bust, baby. We're going to bust that clot. In hemodynamically stable, there's no need to bust up a clot and increase the risk of the patient bleeding because TPA has the highest risk of bleeding in comparison to anticoagulants and antiplatelets. So now let's kind of just prevent further clot formation and clot propagation. So in this situation here, this is where we do anticoagulants. Okay, so if I'm going to do anticoagulants, the first thing that I would generally start off with with this patient is you can start off initially with heparin. I think that this tends to be one of the more beneficial indications of heparin, especially if a patient has a pulmonary embolism. We can consider, again, unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. It really just depends upon the patient. Uh, low molecular weight's been more beneficial in patients who have cancer. Um, and again, it's even more beneficial in cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis. So there's a lot of different reasons there. Unfractionated is just easier to monitor and it's not as harsh on the kidneys. But that's something that we would start with. And then what we would do is lifelong, if the patient needs to, or not lifelong, generally for a specific time frame, uh, sometimes like three to six months for the patient, we would transition them, we would transition to a DOAC. So in other words, we would can, uh, do like some, something like a 10A inhibitor, so a 10A inhibitor, or we would do a thrombin inhibitor. So again, that's all the rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, or dabigatran ones. Or we could transition them over to warfarin. And this is usually warfarin if the patient has some type of like abnormality, such as antiphospholipid syndrome, it may be more superior in comparison to a DOAC. So that's something to consider. So if a patient has a pulmonary embolism, what we'll do is we'll initially start them off on heparin, maybe get them properly anticoagulated, and then we'll continue and transition them over to a DOAC, and we won't do these lifelong. Um, this is can, you know, generally maybe anywhere from like three to six months we'll continue this therapy until it kind of resolves. All right? That's how we would treat a pulmonary embolism with these particular indications. Now, let's move on to the next particular situation here, which is what if we have uh, thrombi or emboli in vessels of my legs or vessels in certain parts of my abdomen or things of that uh, effect? What do we do for them? All right, my friends, so the next situation is we have a lot of patients who are at very high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Maybe it's because they have, again, very high cholesterol, they smoke. There's a lot of different factors. We're not gonna go down that route, but and patients who have ath clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, in other words, they have uh, coronary artery disease or they've had MIs in the past or they have a, a TIA or they have a history of a CVA so they had a stroke at some point um, or they have peripheral artery disease so they have intermittent claudication at times. These are all atherosclerotic plaques. And the problem with these situations here is if this plaque ruptures at any point in time, now the inner cheesy material is exposed and I can form a platelet plug on top of this. And if I form a platelet plug on top of this, then boom, I'm going to lead to a clot and acute kind of reduction in oxygen supply to the tissues and then that can lead to a lot of problems, death of the tissue. So to prevent these types of adverse events from atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we should use drugs that are going to inhibit the platelet plug, <laughs> antiplatelets. And so that's where kind of like reducing the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, kind of that prevention comes into play, right? Especially in situations if they have CAD, MI, TIA, CVA, or PAD. So oftentimes the first line agent here is going to be aspirin. This is usually going to be the best situation here because again, it's gonna be helpful to inhibit that platelet plug. An alternative, you can either do uh, uh, plus or like, so you can do and or. So we'll say and or. Sometimes some patients may need a little extra antiplatelet blue boost, slightly higher risk of bleeding, but in those situations, you can add on a P2Y12 receptor um, inhibitor. So sometimes we can do aspirin by itself or we can add on a P2Y12 receptor blocker or we could just switch it over to a P2Y12 receptor blocker. Really the only indication of why I would switch aspirin to P2Y12 receptor blocker is they have a contraindication or they have an adverse effect from the aspirin. They're intolerant to it. That would be the only reason. Another really interesting one here. So this is usually aspirin primary. So I'd say that this is gonna be the number one. 
This is usually an and or in situations of really need an extra additional kick of P2Y12 receptor blockers or they have an aspirin intolerance. The third one here is an add-on therapy and this is Solostazole. So you guys remember this one? You guys probably thought it was never gonna come to play. This is that antiplatelet that has the vasodilatory function. So this is a add-on in patients who have very, very, very severe symptoms of PAD. We can add this one on. So if a patient is having very terrible intermittent claudication of their legs, um, we give them aspirin, okay? And then again, you can either do that plus, again, a P2Y12 receptor blocker in really high situate, like really high needs for really heavy antiplatelet blocking, or you could just switch it to a P2Y12 receptor blocker instead of aspirin if they have an aspirin intolerance. Either way, we've done one or both of these. If the patient is still refractory, you can add on solastazole for the symptoms of PD because you give an additional antiplatelet function. And what's the other benefit that I want to put here in red here? What's the additional benefit that solastazole gets? Solastazole, di dipyridamol are PDE3 inhibitors you get a vasodilatory function. So it vasodilates, which may be somewhat beneficial in patients who have PAD. Okay, so I think the really important thing here to remember is that if a patient has atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases and they're at risk for further events, aspirin is the first one. If they have an intolerance, P2Y12 receptor blocker. If they really need a lot of additional antiplatelet effect, because they have a very heavy burden on their atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you can add on clopidogrel, very high risk of bleeding though, and then if they have PAD with refractory symptoms to the above, you can add on solosazole for the additional vasodilatory function. Okay, now we go to the next situation. You have a clot in the arterial circulation of the leg and you have a clot within the venous circulation of the leg. What do we do? We already talked about if there's a plaque there, we give aspirin or clopidogrel, a P2Y12 receptor blocker. Clopidogrel is more commonly utilized and then add on solosazole if you need it. In this situation, if a patient has an acute um, limb ischemia. In other words, they have an acute thromboembolus that forms and now their limb is at threat of actually dying. In these patient populations, what may be beneficial is to actually kind of get ready for the patient. You need to break the clot up. So thrombolytics are the best, but it's high risk in some patient populations. And so what often tends to be the best is catheter, this is what's cool, catheter directed TPA. In other words, we'll send a catheter down into this vessel and squirt TPA right in this localized area to reverse, to reduce the risk of systemic bleeding. So that's one really, really cool, interesting concept here. And this will help to bust up the clot immediately. Okay. Sometimes what we may do though, is we might start kind of preventing the further clot formation and propagation. If we don't know if they're gonna get the catheter directed TPA, or if they're gonna go in surgically and remove it, we may prep them and kind of get them ready prior to surgery or prior to whatever it may be. So prior to the intervention of choice, so prior to the intervention of choice, you can start with heparin. Okay, and then basically that'll just give you the time frame to prevent further clot formation, further prop, uh, clot propagation until they go in there, cut the leg open, remove the clot, or send a catheter down there and release a little bit of TPA and break it up, or suck the clot out of the artery. Either way, if you're gonna get catheter directed TPA, you can give TPA directly here until you get the procedure of choice done, you can continue them on heparin to prevent further, because what is this gonna do? Inhibit clot formation, further clot formation, and propagation, which is really, really helpful to prevent further kind of like clot burden and really reduce the actual, it significantly kind of cause more ischemia to the leg. All right, what about in this situation? A patient has a big old whopping DVT. So they got a deep vein thrombosis. So somewhere within the femoral, the popliteal, the iliac vein, and it's a very heavy burden there. And now the problem is, is that this clot, it can actually kind of break a little piece off and then go up and cause a PE, right? That's one of the more common causes of uh, PEs is a DVT. Well, in this situation here, what often tends to be the best is, is you can kind of like with these, they're not like 
you don't need to break them up immediately. The only time I would say that you need to clot, clot bust is if the, it's such an extensive DVT and it's actually causing nearby ischemia. So there's so much swelling from the DVT that it's compressing nearby arteries or it's so large that it's such an intense kind of clot burden that you have to break it up. You can do catheter directed kind of TPA. So if it's a very, very, very high clot burden, and it's causing significant complications, you can do catheter directed TPA. So you can give TPA more directly into the clot so that you reduce the risk of systemic side effects like bleeding. But oftentimes, you can actually avoid this particular situation. Because again, this is going to clot bust. This is if you really need to bust that clot up as soon as possible. But if you don't need to clot bust, and there's not that extensive of a clot burden, they don't have extensive kind of like a ischemia as a result of the DVT, which is very serious if they have that, then what you can do is you can instead, as an alternative, so what, what would generally be the more common approach, so generally let's say that the patient is um, and not in this particular scenario, what we would do is, is we would start off with heparin. Okay, we'd start off with heparin, and again, you can do unfractionated heparin, or you can do low molecular weight heparin. Get them therapeutic, and then afterwards, you can transition. You can transition to one of the following, a DOAC, which is gonna be more commonly preferred. So this is usually way more preferred over warfarin, or you can do warfarin, or warfarin. And the only time this would be preferred if the patient has antiphospholipid syndrome as a result. And we don't do this lifelong. This may be for like anywhere from like three to six months. Three to six months. Okay. So it's important to remember if a patient has a DVT and it's a heavy, heavy, heavy clot burden, there is one little caveat to that situation where you can give TPA, but you don't give it IV. You actually direct the catheter right to where the actual big clot is in the DVT and squirt the TPA there. If it's not a heavy, heavy clot burden where the patient is actually developing ischemia due to the DVT, which is not common, but if it is, that's very severe, then we can go this route where we actually heparinize them to prevent the clot from getting bigger and propagating and then transition them over to a DOAC or warfarin to allow for the clot to break down slowly over time. And again, prevent the risk of a PE, okay? The last type of vascular event here for peripheral and then central here is this is a really random one. I'm going to quickly go through it because it's not super common. Uh, it's mesenteric venous thrombosis. So mesenteric venous thrombosis. You usually see this in patients who have a lot of hypercoagulable conditions or cancer. Um, and what happens is they develop a clot with inside of their mesenteric vein. And that can lead to a lot of problems. It can lead to portal hypertension, it can lead to ascites, it can lead to a lot of different nasty things. So in this situation, it's a venous clot. Treat it with anticoagulants. That's the best situation there. So oftentimes with this one, what we'll do is we'll do everything that we've kind of continued to talk about here. It's gonna be ingrained into your heads. <laughs> so initially we'll start off with heparin. And again, this can be unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Just remember, lower molecular weight heparin is a little bit better in cancers. And then afterwards, we'll transition. And when we transition, here's what's a little odd. You only transition to warfarin for mesentery venous thrombosis. So I thought that was an interesting one that I wanted to quickly add in. So I think that's important to understand here. When we're talking about, again, preventing these further events, if a patient has had these events and they're at risk for another one, you need to get them on antiplatelets to prevent the uh, clot propagation on the plaque if it ruptures. Especially aspirin, you can consider a P2Y12 receptor blocker as an alternative. If they have an intolerance, you can add it on if it's a very, very heavy you know, atherosclerotic burden. Plus the loss is all if there's symptoms of PAD or refractory. Cuculum ischemia, if you gotta bust the clot up immediately, send a catheter down and squirt TPA. Don't give it systemically because it has a high risk of bleeding. If you need to give them something to prevent the clot from getting any bigger or getting any larger, you can keep them on heparin until they go in, surgically cut the clot out, or aspirate it or break it up with TPA. DVT, if the burden is so high that the DVT is so big that it's compressing, it's so intense that it's causing so much swelling that it's compressing the nearby arteries and causing ischemia, you can go in with a catheter and direct TPA right to that clot and break it up. But if it's not that bad, you can continue to prevent the clot from forming and propagating a lot for it to break down over time with heparin and then transition them over to a DOAC or warfarin, about three to six months. And then lastly, mesenteric venous thrombosis, clot within the mesenteric vein, can cause a lot of ascites, portal hypertension, a lot of problems like that. 
in this situation, heparin initially to break, uh, to kind of prevent clot formation and propagation, and then switch them over to something like warfarin, and the time duration really depends for these patients. It could be anywhere from three to six months as well. All right, let's go on to the next thing, which is a patient who is at risk of developing a DVT and a subsequent PE. How do we treat that? All right, my friend, so the next situation is what if a patient is at risk of developing a DVT that can actually break off and then cause a PE? That's a, that's a pretty nasty situation, right? So if a patient has risk of kind of forming a clot here within their deeper veins of the legs, so femoral, iliac, popliteal, and then that piece of it breaks off, moves up via the what? inferior vena cava and then pumps up into the right atrium and into the right ventricle and then you get a big old pulmonary embolus. So there's two potential kind of complications from this is that you can have a patient who develops a DVT and then subsequently develops a PE. So I think you have to be willing to understand which kind of patient population is at very high risk for developing DVTs and PEs and that's patients that are going to generally kind of be like post-operative. So sometimes who are post-op um, who are you know, especially bedridden, okay, so they're bedridden, patients who have increasing like malignancy. So there's a lot of different kind of like factors here, but I think when it comes down to it, there's three particular reasons of why patients develop clots within their venous circulation, if you guys remember it. It's patients who, again, have stasis of blood flow, they have hypercoagulability, or they have endothelial injury. Now, when patients are especially in the hospital, are bedridden, they're not out of bed, they're not ambulating, they just had a surgery done. In these particular scenarios, they are very high risk of forming clots, especially because of the stasis factor and because of endothelial injury from whatever procedure that they had done to them. And so because of that, we need to be able to consider what can we do to prevent the risk of clot formation and subsequently clot propagation in the venous circulation, yes, this is arterial circulation here, but again, venous that's connecting to the actual pulmonary arterial circulation, anticoagulants. And so oftentimes, yes, out of bed, getting them ambulating is ideal, but if the patient isn't able to get up out of bed, they aren't able to ambulate and provide a movement, then in these situations, you need to try to get them chemical prophylaxis from getting a DVT and subsequently a PE. And so oftentimes, there's two ways that we can go about this. One way is we can give very low dose heparin. Okay, so we can give very low dose heparin. Again, this can be unfractionated heparin or it could be low molecular weight heparin. It really just kind of depends which one's preferable for the patient population. But that would be one particular option here. Low dose heparin. And again, this is usually given subcutaneously. Okay. Another option is, is if a patient is on, um, let's say, anticoagulation for on under for an underlying disease or for an underlying disorder that can serve as VTE prophylaxis. So let, let me give you an example of number two. So an example here of number two, which I think is very important here for number two, is a patient has atrial fibrillation, okay? So a patient has atrial fibrillation and they're taking some type of situation here. So the patient has atrial fibrillation and they're at risk of left atrial thrombus. So if they have AFib, they're going to be on, let's say, um, rivaroxaban, which is one of those 10A inhibitors, okay? That rivaroxaban is particularly used to prevent left atrial thrombus. But on top of that, you'll also get a VTE prophylaxis for it. So you're going to get two benefits for this is you're going to get atrial fibrillation coverage to prevent a left atrial kind of like thrombus and then subsequently emboli, but you can also cover VTE prophylaxis to prevent DVTs and subsequently PEs. So that's a pretty cool concept to remember. So if a patient is not on full dose anticoagulation for an underlying disease, you should start them on one of these, whether it be low dose, subcutaneous, unfractionated, or low molecular weight heparin. But if they are on full dose anticoagulation, then you can just, again, realize that this is treating one of their disorders, but also getting VT prophylaxis. So you don't have to give them both, I think is the key thing. Okay, so it's one or the other. All right, my friends, let's now talk about the last <laughs> final indication of why we would use antiplatelets, anticoagulants, and again, thrombolytics. All right, my friends, so the last situation here is that we can use some of these drugs to prevent clotting of like a lot of like circuitry and catheters and, so, and such and such. Uh, so 
One of the kind of quick reasons here, if a patient is on some type of like situation where they're on heart-lung machines, so if a patient is on like ECMO, so extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, um, or they're on something like uh, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, so cardiopulmonary bypass, these are big stinking catheters and a lot of circuitry that's really dependent upon not clotting off, <laughs> okay? so. If you have a patient who's not anticoagulated, in other words, you don't have a lot of anticoagulation running through, it can clot off the catheters, it can clot off a lot of the circuitry between the ECMO and the co uh, cardiopulmonary bypass system. So in these particular scenarios here, you wanna prevent kind of a clot developing within one of the circuitry that's running in and out of the body. So in this particular scenario, we prefer heparin. And really, when it comes down to it, it's preferable to have unfractionated heparin greater than, like more preferably in comparison to low molecular weight heparin because you have a way closer titration. It's not as harsh on the kidneys. So that would be a particular situation there. The last one here is in patients who have central venous catheters. So if you have a central venous catheter that's placed in the femoral vein or the internal jugular vein or for the, for the good ones, the subclavian vein, and those catheters become clotted off. So sometimes you can get a thrombosis within the catheter. And in those situations, the catheter is not functioning. You aren't able to get things through. So in other words, if I wanted to run IV fluids through this catheter, and then at some point in the catheter, there's a clot within the catheter, it's not able to deliver the IV fluids into the right atrium. So in those situations, I want to reopen up that catheter and get rid of that clot. So in these situations where a patient has a clotted central venous catheter, one of the situations that we can do for this is infuse a very, very low dose of TPA to indwell within the catheter. And so what it'll do is you'll have the catheter kind of just directly, if you think about it, a catheter directed, a little bit of kind of TPA come right here to where the clot is and break that clot up and restore flow to the catheter so you can allow for flow to move through. So in this situation, we give very, very low doses, like I'm talking like two milligrams of TPA to be able to bust open the clot within that clotted central venous catheter, okay? So this is the concept that I want you guys to understand here for the indication. So we have gone through neurological, cardiac, pulmonary, peripheral, central vascular. We went through VT prophylaxis, preventing clotting off of circuitry and very important central venous catheters. And when we talk about a lot of these things, I need to come back to one really important point that I just, I, I sometimes feel like when we go through all the depths of these mechanisms, we can forget it. When we talk about antiplatelets and anticoagulants, they're really, again, blocking the platelet plug, right? They're blocking that platelet plug, and they're also blocking the formation, ooh, sorry, blocking the formation of that fibrin mesh, right? And by doing that, the overall concept for these two drugs here is that they are inhibiting clot formation, and they're also inhibiting clot propagation. They're not breaking down a clot. If you need to acutely break down a clot, that is where thrombolytics come into play. They help to break down the fibrin, which alleviates the fibrin mesh, and they also help to break down some of the fibrinogen that's helping keep the platelets kind of stuck together, is also breaking down some of the fibrin that's actually keeping the platelets kind of like nicely tight against this platelet plug, and that will dissolve and break down the clot. So this will actually dissolve, dissolve the clot, okay? So that's an important kind of concept to take away from this, guys, in the real true layman's terms of it. All right, now that we have gone through the mechanism of action with relationship to the physiology, we've gone through the indications of these drugs in extreme depth. What I need to now talk about is adverse effects, some generalized one for each category, and then the most feared complication of giving an antiplatelet, anticoagulant, and most importantly, a thrombolytic is the patient is going to bleed. So let's talk about all of these one by one. All right, my friends, so now let's, let's actually go through and be very thorough and talk about if we put a patient on one of these particular medications, an antiplatelet, an anticoagulant, a thrombolytic, what are some of the adverse effects? Obviously the most feared one, the most dangerous one, the most common one is going to be bleeding. We'll save that for last because that's obviously the easiest one to understand. You give someone that's trying to, you give them a drug that's either trying to stop clot formation or prevent clot propagation or break down clots, there's always going to be the risk of inadvertent bleeding. We'll discuss that a little bit later.
additional adverse effects that you want to think about and consider that you definitely may see on the exam now is what we're going to talk about. So first one, acetyl, acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin. This is that COX enzyme inhibitor. Now, with this drug, one of the first things to think about is if a patient has severe peptic ulcer disease, you can worsen their peptic ulcer disease. You can worsen their peptic ulcer disease. The reason why is when you give aspirin, there's a specific molecule here. So you know you have what's called arachidonic acid, and it's used to make something called PGE2, which helps to be able to stimulate um, kind of a mucus production within the stomach lining. So it kind of coats the stomach lining and prevents kind of gastric acid erosion, right? Now, if you give somebody, now this pathway is dependent upon the cycle oxygenase enzyme. It stimulates this pathway. So if you give them aspirin, what it's going to do is it's going to inhibit this enzyme. You'll decrease the production of PGE2 and you'll decrease the mucus production, which is that barrier. If you don't have this barrier now, now that gastric acid can start kind of eroding through the actual stomach, leading to these gastric or duodenal ulcers, which is the pathology that we could potentially see here. Okay, so with peptic ulcer disease, this could potentially increase the risk of peptic ulcer disease or worse than a patient's underlying present peptic ulcer disease. Okay, next thing. This one's kind of rare, but it's worth mentioning. There is a disease called Rye syndrome. Now, with Rye syndrome, this is usually occurring in patients who are less than 19 years of age. Now, there's two potential things here. They're either, they're less than 19 years of age, and they have a viral infection of some etiology, and they have, they're taking aspirin in combination. So this is kind of that triad thing there. So Rye syndrome is a less than 19 year old child with a viral infection who takes aspirin, okay? Usually the family member may give them the aspirin not realizing this potential etiology because they have a fever. They're like, okay, here, take some aspirin instead of Tylenol. The reason why this is a problem is because the combination of the viral infection and aspirin in this child can lead to real significant damage to the liver. And the liver then loses the ability to metabolize and clear a very special molecule. So in the liver, it takes something called ammonia and converts it into something called urea, which will then go to our kidneys and our kidneys will then kind of pee that molecule out, right? So that's generally the design, one of the design functions of the liver. So this will then go to the actual kidneys and then you'll pee the urea out. Now, if you damage the liver, you lose this capability and then the ammonia levels build up. When the ammonia levels build up, this causes a lot of damage to your actual central nervous system. And this can lead to cerebral edema. This can lead to seizures. This can lead to an altered mental status. A lot of scary, scary things that you can see within this patient population. And on top of that, the liver also loses the ability to clear lactic acid. And so usually lactic acid is another molecule which will get taken up by the liver and then converted into something called pyruvate, right? So you'll convert this into something called pyruvate, which can be utilized to you know, make either break it down into you know, generally ATP or convert into other pathways. But if you lose the ability of the liver to do this, then lactic acid builds up. And this can lead to an anion gap, metabolic acidosis. So things to watch out for in this patient who can develop Rye syndrome is if they are a less than 19 year old child who has a viral infection, takes aspirin and develops an anion gap metabolic acidosis, Cerebral edema with increased intracranial pressure, seizures, or an altered mental status. These are things to think about. Aspirin, again, kind of modifies the arachidonic acid pathway, right? And because of that, what it'll do is it'll inhibit kind of, so generally when you think about this, this can, one of the other things about aspirin is it can increase what's called um, acute asthma exacerbation of respiratory diseases. So it can really kind of like worsen like sinusitis and nasal polyps and asthma and things of that effect. And the reason behind this is that aspirin, similar to this process above, is you take arachidonic acid and it can get broken down into two pathways. One is it can get broken down to like what's pro called prostaglandins or thromboxane kind of A2, right? And then the other one is leukotrienes. Now, this pathway here going to thromboxanes and prostaglandins is dependent upon cyclooxygenase. 
This one going to leukotrienes is dependent upon lipooxygenase. Aspirin only really inhibits the cyclooxygenase. And so you decrease this pathway. But then you have all this arachidonic acid that can't go here, and so it shunts it into this pathway. And so you make lots of leukotrienes. The problem behind that is that lots of leukotrienes cause a lot of inflammation. It causes kind of bronchospasm. It can cause a lot of these problems that worsen things like nasal polyps and sinusitis and asthma. And so that's really the kind of the problematic issue here is that with this increase in leukotrienes, you get this increase in inflammation and you know, permeability and vasodilation cap capability or, uh, problems that you see with this disease. Okay, that's the big thing. Now, the next thing that you wanna understand here is if a patient actually takes way too much aspirin, maybe it's a suicide attempt, maybe they don't realize it and they take just a large dose of aspirin or they're having pain or some potential problem they just take way too much and they develop toxicity. You should be able to recognize this. How do we recognize this? All right, next concept here is if a patient actually takes way too much aspirin and they develop toxicity. Some of the mild side effects that aren't really bad, you can actually remember this is kind of like a triad. <laughs> There's always these dang triads, but um, it's usually nausea, um, vomiting, and tinnitus. So kind of ringing in the ears. This is usually the triad. And this is usually mild. It's not gonna require any kind of a, 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 you know, aggressive treatments. But if they progress to moderate to severe toxicity, what happens is aspirin really alters a lot of like metabolism of things around the electron transport chain. And this can lead to a massive increase in lactic acid. And it can also increase the production of ketone bodies. And the combination of an increase in ketones and an increase in lactic acid leads to an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So that's one potential thing that you can see. The second thing is that aspirin may actually stimulate an increase in your respiratory drive. So if your respiratory drive center, which is controlling kind of your inspiratory cycles, like your respiratory rate and depth, if this is increased, you'll increase your respiratory rate and depth. And so you'll breathe really, really fast. And this can create something called a respiratory alkalosis. One other potential etiology, and we don't know how exactly it does this, but aspirin may directly cause damage to the lung parenchyma and lead to pulmonary edema. So it may lead to what's called non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So other things to watch out for is anion gap metabolic acidosis, as well as a respiratory alkalosis, as well as non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and then one more thing. Aspirin toxicity can also kind of cause a lot of you know, injurious type of problems with the central nervous system, where it can produce things like altered mental status, it may produce confusion, and it may even induce possible seizures. So it's something to be able to think about. So watch out for these potential complications if a patient has toxic side effects from taking way too much aspirin. If they do, generally the treatment of choice here is to give them IV fluids, to give them sodium bicarbonate to try to alkalinize the blood. So you're trying to really increase the pH of the blood because right now their pH is really low. And then lastly is if the patient is really, really severe, you can consider something called hemodialysis to dialyze off all of the aspirin, okay? All right, my friends, that's the adverse effects that we really wanna be careful with when we talk about aspirin. Let's now move on to the next group, the P2Y12 receptor blockers. All right, my friends, so the next thing here is when we talk about P2Y12 receptor blockers. So this is your clopidogrel, this is your prosugrel, this is your teclopidine, this is your ticagrelor. One of the big things to think about with these particular drugs is is again, especially to clopidine, especially to clopidine, there's a risk of something called TTP, okay? So there is an increased risk of a disease process called TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Now, in TTP, what's the underlying kind of reasoning behind this? There is a protein that our body has, and it's called Adam TS13. And what this protein really does is, is it actually breaks down, so it actually will inhibit what's called von Wildebrand factor. So it'll break it down. So generally, like you have what's called von Wildebrand factor, that's usually gonna be kind of, let's say that there's kind of like a von Wildebrand factors that are kind of expressed here. Platelets love to bind onto that, right? 
And so what it does is it breaks down von Willebrand factors so that you don't have a lot of places for platelets to be able to bind to. Because if you have a lot of von Willebrand factor proteins, that's a site where the GP1B proteins love to stick to the von Willebrand factor. So that's basically trying to prevent unnecessary platelet aggregation. All right, so this basically will inhibit or decrease platelet kind of activation or and plug, right, kind of formation. Well, here's the problem. If a patient has ta is taking, let's say, they're taking teclopidine, all right, they're taking one of the actual P2Y12 receptor blockers, but I'd say the most significant one to be able to remember, I can't stress this enough, guys, is teclopidine. You can see it to a smaller degree with the other ones, just not as common. So here we're gonna have a P2Y12 receptor inhibitor that the patient is taking. What's the most common one again? Say it out loud, teclopidine. What happens is this, this drug can activate our immune cells to produce maybe some autoantibodies. And these autoantibodies are antibodies that are directed against Adam's TS13. So now these antibodies are gonna go here and lead to the destruction or decrease in the actual presence of Adam TS13. Now, if there's less Adam TS13, can you break down the von Willebrand factor? No. And so von Willebrand factors won't be broken down, and so you're gonna have an increase in the von Willebrand's factor. If you have lots of von Willebrand factor, now the problem is, is that you have lots of sites now, these little proteins that platelets love to stick to. And the platelets will stick, they'll become activated, they'll release these molecules like ADP, thromboxane A2, and cause other platelets to come, stick with them, and form a platelet plug. And then the problem here is that you're going to increase the platelet ag activation, aggregation, and the platelet plug formation. And then, subsequently, what do you develop? You develop a clot or a thrombus. So then you develop thrombi. Oh man, this ain't good, man. Ain't good, man. Because then now, if I make all these thrombi, guess what's gonna happen? These are gonna form all over the dang place. So here's my arterial circulation. I'm gonna have all these thrombi just formed everywhere. Here's the problem with this. Now, if I have all these thrombi formed within all these microvessels, when blood is flowing through there, it can shred apart red cells, shred apart platelets. This can block off blood flow to the kidneys and lead to a lot of problems in the brain. And so the complications that you want to remember is fat RN. What, Zach, what'd you just say? I know it's a terrible thing, but it's the way that you can remember kind of the classic features of TTP is fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal failure, and neurosymptoms. So let's write that down again. What are the potential features here that you could see? Fever, could be a cytokine response. Anemia due to ripping up the, the actual red blood cells as they run through here. Thrombocytopenia, which is they're getting consumed within the actual formation of clots. Renal failure, because it's actually blocking off blood flow to the actual kidneys, and neuro symptoms. This is a really, really important concept, okay? So if a patient is taking a P2Y12 receptor blocker, and all of a sudden they develop thrombocytopenia with associated fever, anemia, again, renal failure, and some type of neurological symptoms such as altered mental status, fever, strokes, things to that effect, they could potentially have TTP because of that drug. Think about that. And then oftentimes we treat these patients with what's called Plex. So we do something called plasma exchange. We basically clean their blood and get rid of all of the actual P2Y12 receptor inhibitor and get rid of these autoantibodies that are really the problem, okay? Sometimes you can even consider other things as well, but like, you know, steroids and that effect, but generally Plex is gonna be the, the best situation here. One other thing here is that some of these drugs, especially teclopidine, may also suppress the bone marrow. Exactly how? Unsure, but I think the big thing to remember here is teclopidine is a bad drug. <laughs> Don't use it. And when you use teclopidine, one of the things that it can do is it can inhibit the bone marrow from producing red blood cells, so they can experience uh, anemia, and they can also experience neutropenia. So watch out for neutropenia and also watch out for just generalized anemia as well. All right, 
One more kind of adverse effect. So we talked about TTP, we talked about bone marrow suppression with teclopidine. The other thing to remember here is that some of these drugs, especially really, really important here, clopidogrel. So clopidogrel can have what's called a CYP2C19 polymorphism. You're like, what in the crap? This is usually seen with, again, what particular drug out of all of these? So again, we had prosugrel, we had ticagrelor, we have clopidogrel, we have teclopidine. This is primarily seen with clopidogrel. So some patients have mutations in this cytochrome enzyme found within the liver. So this is gonna be your liver. Your liver has the cytochrome P450 system. This is one of them, CYP2C19. And what it does is, it takes clopidogrel and it actually will activate it. So this is the pro drug and then it'll be converted into the, actually their active drug, okay? Via this particular enzyme. Some patients may have variations. In other words, they may have one form of this where they have increased activity. Some patients may have increased activity of their CYP2C19. And if that's the case, they're gonna rapidly metabolize this clopidogrel into the active drug. And if that's the case, they'll have increased response. There'll be increased responders to clopidogrel. In other words, they may have a slightly higher risk of bleeding, but they'll respond really, really well to that drug. The other way is that you can think about another polymorphism. So there could be increased activity, but there also could be decreased activity. And this is again, all based upon like genetic factors here of the CYP2C19. That means that this enzyme won't perform very well. It won't convert the pro-drug into the active drug. And there'll be poor responders, poor responders to clopidogrel. How do we really tell this though? Is there any test that we could actually utilize? Man, that would be cool if there is, and yes, there is. One of the tests that we can actually utilize to analyze if a patient is a good responder or a poor responder to the clopidogrel because there is this variation or polymorphism in this gene is we can check what's called a P2Y12 level. So if I checked it in this patient population, I would check their P2Y12 assay. And typically in these patients, if they're really you know, good responders, they'll have low P2Y12 levels because you're really inhibiting that receptor. If it has very low activity, decreased activity of this, CY, uh, this enzyme, now their P2Y12 levels, Y12 levels will be very high because they're not gonna be having as much inhibition of this particular receptor. Because what we're doing is we're testing the platelets for this particular receptor. And if there's a lot of inhibition of it, meaning that they are, what, good responders, it should be low. And if we actually have poor responders, they should be having high P2Y12 levels. So that's something that we can check. All right, my friends, that's the things that we have to watch out for this drug category, okay? One other thing to add on here, just as a quick aside, is that bleeding risk. When we talk about uh, bleeding with respect to clopidogrel versus teclopidine versus prosugrel versus ticagrelor, I think one thing, we're gonna talk about bleeding risk in a second, but I think it's important to remember that prosugrel and ticagrelor have kind of some degree of increased risk of bleeding in comparison to all the others. So I think it's important to remember for these two, they have a high bleeding risk, almost to some degree even, especially the prosugrel, um, a black box warning for the bleeding that they could potentially cause. So just be aware of that clopidogrel, um, not as much, um, but to cagrelor and prosugrel, especially prosugrel, and here, let's actually do that as well, prosugrel, even more so than ticagrelor, have higher bleeding risk associated with it. Okay, let's come down and talk about the next group, the PDE3 inhibitors. So the next one here is the PDE3 inhibitors. So this is the celostazole and dipyridamol. Now with these, because they do cause vasodilation, they can actually dilate the cerebral vessels. And so because there may be some degree of like cerebral vasodilation, it may kind of cause them to bang on the noisiceptors in the dura mater. So if you dilate them, there may be a lot of noisiceptors nearby when you dilate these. And here's the dura mater right here. So there may be like little pain receptors. And when you dilate this vessel, it may now squish and press down on some of these like pain receptors and noisy receptors that are nearby. And that may lead to headaches.
And so because of that, one of the things that you want to watch out here is that the patients could potentially develop headaches. Here's one more. This is really important. I think it's really something to consider is that there is an increased mortality of, uh, in patients who have CHF um, if you utilize these drugs. So if a patient has some type of heart failure, whether it be a heart failure with a reserved or, uh, or reduced ejection faction, uh, it's been shown that this drug category can potentially increase mortality. So avoid it. That's just all I can say about that. All right, we covered acetylsalicylic acid or aspirin. Covered PUD, acute exacerbation of respiratory diseases, Rye syndrome, right? We talked about the toxicity effect. And then we went over P2Y12 receptor blockers. Watch out for TTP, especially with teclopidine. Bone marrow suppression with teclopidine. Watch out for the CYP, uh, 2C19 polymorphism with clopidogrel. Because you can have some people who are poor responders and good responders. You can assess that with the P2Y12 level. And then again, we talked about patients who are taking these. Just be careful more specifically with prosugrel and with ticagrelor. They're going to have a higher bleeding risk in comparison to teclopidine, in comparison to clopidogrel, and even in comparison to acetylsalicylic acid. Okay, let's now move on to the next thing, which is going to be heparin. All right, my friends, so now we're gonna talk about heparin. So this is gonna include, again, your unfractionated heparin, your low molecular weight heparin, and technically, if you even wanted to add that one in there, you can even consider Fonda Paranox. So when we talk about these, one of the big things that you wanna think about, and I think this is really the most common with unfractionated heparin, more than you're gonna see in low molecular weight heparin, and way more than you're gonna see in Fonda Paranox, is a disease called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. We call this HIT. So again, I want you guys to think about a disease here called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So we'll write this one right here. So heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. With heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, obviously it's induced by heparin. And when you see this is again, how does this all happen? How does this really happen? All right, so let's say that a patient takes heparin. And again, I think it's really important to establish which one of these is really gonna be the more common type. That's really, really important because if it comes up on your exam, you need to be able to identify that. So here we're taking a patient, they take some medication called heparin, gets into their bloodstream. If we're gonna look here, it's gonna be unfractionated heparin is gonna be more common this to induce this than low molecular weight heparin. Fauna paranox, pretty much almost nil. Okay, but if you wanted to, it would even be less common than low molecular weight heparin. So they take this drug. When they take this drug, what happens is the heparin will bind with something called platelet factor four. Okay, so here is going to be the heparin, and what the heparin is going to do is, is it's going to combine with something. Let's draw this in pink here. It's going to combine with something called platelet factor four. So now I have these two molecules that are going to kind of complex together. When they complex together, what it does is, it forms an immunogenic complex. It's very immunogenic. And it activates our immune system cells. And our immune system cells will develop a response to this kind of complex and start producing antibodies against this complex. So now if I look over here, I'm gonna have this complex here. Here's the heparin. Okay, here's the heparin that I'm taking in. And again, which one more commonly? Unfractionated over low molecular weight heparin, which is way more common than Fonda Paranox. And then if I were to kind of like draw like a binding connection here, we'll do this with black here. Here's going to be the heparin, heparin. And it's combined with platelet factor four. It's combined with this thing called platelet factor four. It stimulated this immune system response, the immune system when activated produced these antibodies and these antibodies are like, mm -mm, I'm going to bind to you. And then look, it's going to bind onto this kind of complex here. When we bind onto this and now we have the antibodies bound to this, now it's kind of having, you have these IgG antibodies which are bound to heparin and platelet factor four. Guess what it does? It then sticks to platelets. And now it's going to activate platelets. So now you're going to have this whole complex. And what you're going to do is you're going to have this whole thing bind on to platelets. So here's going to be a bunch of platelets. When this kind of binds onto the platelets, it's going to activate all of these platelets. When they become activated, they're going to want to stick together. When they stick together and they activate and they start causing all of this problem, guess what you're going to get? a big old platelet plug, and then subsequently, 
a thrombus formation. So now I have this connection here. I increase, I actually have this platelet factor four, which binds with the heparin. My immune um, system produces IgG antibodies that binds with this. This binds to platelets. It increases the activation of platelets, increases the formation of the platelet plug, and increases the thrombi to form. Now, look at this. I get thrombi forming all over my vascular system. And here's the problem in comparison to DTP. It forms in the arterial circulation and, oh man, and the venous circulation. This is a no-no. Because if I get thrombi all over the dang place here, this is a big situation. If I get in the arterial circulation, this can cause an MI. If it gets stuck in the actual cerebral circulation, it may cause a stroke. If it gets stuck in the leg, it can cause an acute limb ischemia. If it gets stuck in the venous circulation, it can cause a DVT. If it gets stuck in the uh, DVT and then it breaks off and causes a PE. Oh my gosh, this is a terrible situation to occur. So, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is when a patient takes heparin. When they have the heparin, they bind it with something called platelet factor 4, which is expressed on platelets. IgG antibodies then bind to the heparin and platelet factor 4 complex, which is pre present here. So now look, look at this. Here's the heparin here. We're going to draw in red. Here's the platelet factor 4, which is bound to the heparin. And then now we're going to have all these IgG antibodies that are stuck to this, and it's going to create this kind of activation of the platelets and lead to an increased clot, which is going to form an arterial and venous circulation. It can lead to arterial and venous uh, thrombi. On top of that, whenever you give heparin, you give it subcutaneously. So generally with these sub-Q injections, um, especially with the sub-Q injections, one of the things that you may see around the injection site where you're giving the heparin is it may produce some skin necrosis around the injection site. So this is really adding to the diagnosis. So if a patient has arterial thrombi, venous thrombi, skin necrosis around the injection site, and then one more thing. When you consume, when you actually kind of cause these platelets to form a platelet plug, you consume the platelets. So this is going to lead to consumption of the platelets. So what this is going to do is it's going to cause a consumptive drop in the platelets, a thrombocytopenia, if you will. This is the fourth factor. These are all factors that you want to remember for a patient who has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, okay? If this develops, you discontinue the heparin, okay? So discontinue the heparin, and then switch them over to another molecule. If you still have to anticoagulate the patient, you've got to give them something. So give them something that won't interact with, that won't be a heparin molecule or will interact with antithrombin 3 and all these kind of problems. So you would think, oh, what about direct factor inhibitors? Wouldn't factor 10A inhibitors work? You would think, but they're oral. And so what, you're like, okay, well, if I can't give the oral one, which ones were the IV ones? Oh, wait. What if it's the thrombin inhibitors that are gatriban and bivalirubin? That was the IV one. You probably want to give this because these patients are critically ill, right? Absolutely. So in this scenario, you prefer to give the thrombin inhibitors. And the reason why is you want to give the IV version. And the IV version is going to be um, what's called argatriban. Argatriban. And another one is called bivalirubin. So in these patients, discontinue the heparin and switch them over to a thrombin inhibitor that is IV for critically ill patients. If they're not as critically ill, you can potentially consider um, the oral medications like the oral thrombin inhibitors like dabigatran or the oral 10A inhibitors like rivaroxaban, dipixaban, and doxaban. But generally, this is the more critical situation here. All right, another concept here. One more going off of heparin here is that when we talk about these drugs, um, I think with respect to kind of comparing the two. So let's say here I have unfractionated heparin and here I have low molecular weight heparin. Sometimes this is an important kind of like concept to understand is what really comes down to the difference in these drugs and which one you prefer. One of them is unfractionated heparin, 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 uh, unfractionated heparin really isn't um, as much of a, a, a damage on the kidneys. So it's less risk um, of, you know, problems with renal failure. In other words, in, less risk of um, increasing levels in 
AKI and CKD. In other words, if a patient has AKI or CKD, you don't have to adjust the dose of unfractionated heparin, which is nice. Whereas with low molecular weight heparin, you have a higher risk of increasing levels in AKI and CKD. And so you'll have to renally dose these particular drugs. So if a patient has underlying chronic kidney disease or uh, acute kidney injury, I would say no to giving them or be very careful with low molecular weight heparin. Whereas if they have it in this situation, you're okay with giving unfractionated heparin. It's more preferred. Another thing it comes down to is um, half-life. Unfractionated heparin is very uh, short half-life. So what, what's important about that is that it makes it very titratable, very titratable agent, okay? Whereas something like low molecular weight heparin, this has a relatively longer half-life. So it's not as easily titratable. And that's why whenever we have patients who we need to have a very, very tight control of their anticoagulation, we may prefer unfractionated heparin because this makes it more likely to be an infusion, whereas this is not gonna be an infusion. It's usually gonna be like once or twice a day that we would give this particular drug. All right, one more thing here is that low molecular weight heparin tends to be superior in patients who have cancer in comparison to unfractionated heparin. So in unfractionated heparin, it has less um, kind of effect in cancer Whereas in low molecular weight heparin, it's gonna have increased efficacy in cancer. Another concept here is that with low molecular weight heparin, we can really do this uh, relatively well since it's a longer half-life. It doesn't have to be kind of an infusion. You can give this as a injection outpatient. So because of this kind of half-life and this ease of titration, it makes this a more reliable outpatient medication, whereas since this has to be an infusion, it's more reliable as an inpatient type of medication. Okay, just a couple things to really kind of like add on here since we're talking about anticoagulants here. Okay, my friends, we've now covered with heparin, we covered heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, things to watch out for with that one. We talked about what we would switch to if that happens. We talked about some other kind of like small differences between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin, especially with kidney disease, half-lifes, which one's preferred for inpatient, outpatient, and which one's a little bit better and more efficacious in situations such as cancer. Okay, now let's move on to the other ones, which is gonna be your direct oral acting anticoagulants, the 10 and uh, thrombin inhibitors, and then we'll talk about warfarin. All right, next thing is DOAC. So this is gonna include, again, your, um, your direct acting. So this is gonna be your um, 10 inhibitors, so your 10A inhibitors, and this is gonna include your thrombin inhibitors, right? So rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, dabigatran, bivalirudin, or gatraban, all those sons of guns. One of the biggest things, to be honest with you, they don't really have a lot of like complications. Their risk of bleeding is a lot lower than the vitamin K antagonists like warfarin. Um, but with these, they're really dependent upon renal function. Since they're renally excreted, um, if a patient has some type of chronic kidney disease or they have an acute kidney injury, one of the downside about this is it can actually lead to the increasing levels of this drug, similar to low molecular weight heparin. So it can increase the levels of the DOACs and can therefore increase the risk of bleeding. One other thing to go along with this, just as an aside, because you may, you may see this, is that out of all of these 10A inhibitors and factor two inhibitors, um, or the thrombin inhibitors, only one, one of these drugs can be removed by hemodialysis. So if a patient is taking, is on hemodialysis, there's only one out of all of these drugs that can actually be removed. Do you guys know which one is actually able to be removed by hemodialysis? This is the bigotran, okay? It is the only one that can be removed out of all of these direct acting um, oral anticoagulants. It's the only one. All right, that's it for that one. The next one is your vitamin K antagonist. Now, with vitamin K antagonist, this is really just warfarin. This is your warfarin. What are some big things to think about with this one? Watch out for teratogenicity, okay? This one you should not give to patients who are actually pregnant. 
The reason why is it crosses the placenta. If it cr crosses the placenta, that could be absolutely disastrous. So this can actually cross the placenta. If that drug crosses, crosses the placenta, it can increase the risk of fetal bleeding. So this can increase fetal bleeding and then fetal demise. So that's one particular contraindication that you would not want to give this drug in. Do not give it to someone who is pregnant. The second thing here is that warfarin is heavily metabolized by cytochrome P450s enzymes. And there's a lot of other drugs that are as well. And so this really comes down to really safety because there is a lot of drug interactions. And I think this is worth mentioning. Um, the reason why is if a patient is having many medical issues, they may be on warfarin for atrial fibrillation or because they have some other disease process that we talked about. And if they're on that, but they're also taking a medication for another disease that they have, maybe they have an arrhythmia, that drug that they could be taking could alter their levels of warfarin. And that's dangerous because warfarin operates in a very narrow kind of therapeutic window. And if we increase the levels of our warfarin, we could potentially cause bleeding. If we keep it less than the levels that we want, they could clot. So it's very, very critical that we understand that. So there's a lot of things that can alter this cytochrome P450 system. So in this situation, it's different from clopidogrel. We go from the inactive form, um, sorry, so we go from this drug, we're gonna kind of metabolize it, right? And so whenever you metabolize this drug, you go from its activated form and then you inactivate it. And unlike the pro-drug like clopidogrel, it went from pro-drug to active drug. I think because understanding that warfarin can be metabolized by this, it can be altered in some particular way. So, so what do I mean? Let's say I have one drug category. We're gonna call these inhibitors. So they inhibit the cytochrome P450 system. So if we imagine here, let's draw this as kind of like um, a little dot here. This is gonna be this green dot. So whenever this green dot binds into this socket here, it inhibits the enzyme from actually metabolizing and breaking down warfarin. So if that's the case, what would that do to the levels of active warfarin? If it can't go through this, it's going to increase the levels of warfarin, which increases the risk of bleeding. Oh, shoot. So because of that, I really should know some of these drugs. I want you to remember, Pam! <laughs> if any of you guys watch The Office, you'll know what that means, but Pam! We got proton pump inhibitors, amiodarone, azoles, acetaminophen, and then macrolides. And I think these will cover kind of the more common categories of drugs. And so these, if they bind onto this, they'll inhibit the enzyme, they can't metabolize it. Oh, that's, that's really important. So I want you to remember that this is going to increase the levels of warfarin, which increases the risk of bleeding. Now take the other in, in indication, the other situation here, we have an inducer. And so in an inducer, let's pick another color for this one. Let's just do um, this kind of like blue here. With this inducer, it can bind on here. And what it'll do is it'll stimulate this enzyme to increase the metabolism. And so then I'll decrease the actual levels of the active drug and increase the levels of the inactive drug. So I'll basically metabolize the warfarin and decrease the levels of the warfarin. So that's important. So what this is gonna do, it's gonna decrease the levels of the warfarin. This, you can remember, CPR. Okay, so some of the drugs in this category, there's a bunch, that, you know, that, but I think these are some of the more commonly utilized ones. So this could include carbamazepine, which is an anti-epileptic and using trigeminal neuralgia. Another one is called phenytoin, we'll put PHT. And then another one for tuberculosis is rifampin. So I think these are really important things to be able to remember, my friends. Okay, teratogenic, please don't give it in that increased risk of fetal bleeding and demise. And then again, drug interactions, things to watch out for that actually can increase the levels or decrease the levels of warfarin. One more thing, there's something called warfarin-induced skin necrosis. So what is this called? It's called warfarin induced skin necrosis. Can't say I've ever seen this, but it's something to think about. 
Whenever somebody develops, whenever somebody takes warfarin, what we know is, is that warfarin inhibits the vitamin K epoxide reductase, which is going to basically decrease the synthesis of a lot of functional proteins. So some of those were procoagulant, so we'll put them up here. So some of these are procoagulant, factors two, factors seven, factors nine, factors 10, right? These are wanting to induce clots. The other ones are protein, C and S. These are anticoagulants. Here's what happens. When protein C and protein S naturally are produced, what they do is they kind of are circulating through the blood. So here's protein C and a protein S. They're circulating through the blood and then there's a protein on the blood vessel called thrombomodulin. And what thrombomodulin will do is it'll activate protein C. So now you have protein C and protein S and we're gonna put like plus sign here. This is an activated one. And what this does is, is this inhibits other particular clotting proteins that want to induce clots. It inhibits factor five, and it inhibits factors eight. So now if I inhibit these two factors, I basically reduce the risk of forming a clot. So the kind of concept here is I'm inhibiting clot formation. So what's the overall kind of thought process behind this is I'm inhibiting clot formation. Now, we get throw warfarin in the mix. You give warfarin, when you give warfarin, you're inhibiting the enzyme that helps to stimulate this process. I'll decrease the production of this, but I'll really decrease the production of this first. Whenever this decreases, I have less protein C and protein S. Even if I have thrombomodulin, I don't have the activation of this. I don't inhibit factors five, so this is actually the stimulated and it's supposed to, again, inhibit these particular proteins from functioning. But I can't inhibit them because I don't have an act, I don't have these to get activated. So if I don't have this to get activated, I can't inhibit these particular proteins. And so what happens is they remain stimulated. If they remain stimulated, they help to propagate a clot formation. So you're probably like, okay, wait, 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 wait hold on, hold on, I gotta call you out on this. I thought warfarin was to, supposed to stop clot formation. That was the whole point of being an anticoagulant. Now it's causing clots. What, what the heck is going on here? This process is very transient, very short-lived. This usually happens in the first four to five days after taking warfarin. So four to five days, generally after taking warfarin. And then what happens is this starts to kick in and then you really start kind of preventing clot formation, okay? That's the underlying kind of process here. So warfarin does lead to the inhibition of these particular you know, procoagulants, which you'll get an anticoagulant effect out of it. But in the early phase, it does actually kind of cause a decrease in these anticoagulants. And so you get a slight procoagulant effect, but it's very, very short-lived, a couple days. And so because of that, if I do increase clot formation, I lead to these thrombi forming Right? I may lead to like small thrombi forming in small vessels near my cutaneous circulation, and that can cause skin necrosis. And so one of the things that you want to remember is, is if I actually do cause some of these small little cutaneous vessels to kind of get clotted off because of the protein C and protein S, and as a result, I end up with a little bit of necrosis around that area, this is very short-lived. And we can actually prevent this. The way that we prevent this is we do something called bridging. Okay, we do something called bridging. In other words, I start the patient on heparin, and then once I get them therapeutic, so I'll put them on heparin, and I'll get them to a therapeutic point. Then what I'll do is I will kind of switch to warfarin. So there may be a small period of time, so what I'll do is I'll get them on heparin, I'll keep them kind of nice and anticoagulated, and then once I got kind of nice and anticoagulated, I'll add on warfarin. So there may be a small period of time where they're on both warfarin and on heparin. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna titrate the heparin down, get my warfarin nice and therapeutic, but I'm gonna have the heparin give me the anticoagulant action for a couple days. Then after that four or five day period, now protein C and protein S aren't the problem. Now it's just these that I'm kind of dropping down and I'm actually gonna get that anticoagulant effect and that'll kick in and that'll soothe right over. So generally what we do is we start people off on kind of bridging them with heparin for a couple days
We'll put them on warfarin, we'll put them on heparin, kind of get them nice and therapeutic, and then we'll take the heparin off and then continue them on warfarin for however long they need to be on it. Okay, so that's the way that we can generally prevent warfarin-induced skin necrosis is by bridging them through the short procoagulant period due to the drop in protein C and protein S for a couple days and then they get the full anticoagulant effect afterwards after that kind of like prothrombotic state has occurred. Okay, all right my friends, that covers vitamin K antagonists. Let's move on to the last thing which is patient takes any one of these medications and they bleed. What do we do? If a patient is taking any of these medications, yes, there is a risk of bleeding. Sometimes this bleeding can be very minor. It's very important to be able to differentiate between something and being very minor and something to be like life-threatening and severe. So, and again, we'll go over kind of like the degree of which one has the most bleeding risk a little bit later. But when we talk about these, if a patient is taking, whether it be an antiplatelet, an anticoagulant, or a thrombolytic, they can develop very minor characteristics of a bleed. All right, so what are some of those that you should be able to recognize? I'd say look for like skin bleeding, right? So if a patient develops like little petechial lesions, so little petechial lesions are one. Um, another one is like ecchymosis. This is another one to watch out for. Um, other things just maybe like prolonged bleeding. So maybe they have like a wound or a cut and they're just bleeding from like that actual wound for a little bit longer time period. So these are like minor things to watch out for, okay? Um, another one is going to be sometimes just like epistaxis. So if they're bleeding from their nose, so if they have epistaxis, um, or if they have any kind of like bleeding from their gingiva, so gingival bleeding. Okay. These are minor. They're not going to exsanguinate from this. Epistaxis, just be careful, especially with posterior epistaxis. If there's significant like splurging of blood back there, that might move them over into like more of the moderate and severe type if it's getting pretty bad that you would actually consider reversing the drug. So just be careful. I would kind of add this one over here just with the kind of like the point of being cautious if it's posterior epistaxis, that might get you over into like the more moderate and severe section. And the reason why I'm kind of doing this is that if a patient develops a little like petechial lesions or ecchymosis, or they're just bleeding a little bit longer from their skin, or they have like a little anterior epistaxis, or they have like a little bit of a gingival bleeding, or they're bleeding a little bit from their uterus, um, or they're having a little bit of a knee, kind of like they're having like a, a, a hemarthrosis, those aren't indications where I'm going to reverse the drug. It's really not. It's more they're exsanguinating, they're at risk of death that I would consider reversing the drug. And I think that's a really important point to get. So if it's a posterior epistaxis where they're really bleeding, that might move them over, that may transition them, just to be cautious here, this may kind of transition them over into moderate to severe. Just be careful of that, okay? Same thing with uterine bleeding. So if a patient's developing kind of like uterine bleeding, this may be some degree of mild, but again, with the caveat here, that if the bleeding becomes to the point where they're exsanguinating, then this could potentially move them, just being cautious here, that it could be anywhere from mild, but sometimes it may progress, and just be careful, it may cause a severe blood loss, especially if they're like dropping more than a liter. So if they're getting to the point where they're dropping like greater than about a liter of blood, in a 24 hour period, then that's a little bit more severe. And that would kind of move them over into the moderate severe category. Last one is if they develop kind of like blood within their joint. So they develop like a hemarthrosis. Hemarthrosis. So these are the things that I'm talking about. If a patient comes in, they got mild like skin lesions, like petechial lesions, ecchymosis, prolonged bleeding time. They have an anterior epistaxis. They have mild uterine bleeding. They have hemarthrosis. Those are things that you can kind of just keep and monitor the patient's drug levels. Make sure maybe see if you have to make any modifications to their drug levels. Okay, maybe you got to hold a dose or something like that. But if the patient comes in and they have a massive posterior epistaxis or a massive uterine bleeding where they're losing like a large like volume over kind of a 24 hour period, that might put them over into this moderate severe category. So watch out for posterior epistaxis and very significant uterine bleeding. Another thing is if they develop like a big old honking bleed in their brain. So if they develop like an intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage, these are also things to consider. So watch out for things like you know, intracranial hemorrhages, 
Um, watch out for things like subarachnoid hemorrhages or subdural hematomas, things to that effect that are maybe related to their anticoagulation. Another one is if they're like bleeding into their GIT, so they're about like a, a large, like a, a GI bleed of some type, whether that be kind of an upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed. Obviously, upper GI bleeds are going to be more brisk, potentially, and scarier, but GI bleeds, this can cause a pretty significant amount of blood loss. So just think about that one as well. Um, the other thing is that sometimes people can bleed into like behind their actual GIT, so into what's called the retroperitoneum. So watch out for this as well. As well. I'm going to kind of abbreviate this one, our RPH, so retroperitoneal hemorrhages. These are also things that you want to be careful of as well. So if a patient develops a brain bleed, they develop a GI bleed, a bleed behind the uh, peritoneum, the retroperitoneal bleed, massive posterior epistaxis, massive uterine bleeding, or they develop bleed within these cavities. So a bleed within the peritoneum, obviously it may be a GI bleed, bleed within the retroperitoneum, retroperitoneal bleed. But what about blood within their pleural cavity? They develop a massive hemothorax or within their pericardium, a hemopericardium. So these are also things that are life threatening. So hemothorax and then a hemopericardium, which increases the risk of the patient developing cardiac tamponade, and this increases the risk of forming like maybe a tension pneumothorax of some type. So I think these are things to think about. So this, these are severe situations, super obvious, right? But if a patient is exsanguinating from a posterior epistaxis or an abnormal uterine bleeding, that's also concerning. In these situations, these, <laughs> they need reversal of the antiplatelet, the anticoagulant, or the thrombolytic. In these scenarios, not so much. Maybe just monitor the levels, keep an eye on them, see if they're too high, if you have to make some dose adjustments or hold the dose a little bit. No need for emergent or immediate reversal. That is why this is important to differentiate, okay? Now, I've kind of been talking about this a little bit, which is how do I really determine the levels of a drug, right? Is, do I, what do I do? Just be like, hey, eh. What's, what's the level of that drug again? Oh yeah, it's good, all right, cool. No, we, gotta, we have to have no specific tests, right? <laughs> so I think one of the big things to think about here is what are some of the tests that I can utilize? So one of the big ones here is what's called your PTT. So we can monitor what's called your PTT. Now your PTT is your partial thromboplastin time. And what I wanna know is, is if the PTT is way too high because that increases the risk of bleeding. So that really looks at a couple different drugs, but the most common one, to be honest with you, is going to be heparin, and it's really a specific type of heparin. This is really unfractionated heparin that really kind of is based upon the PTT level. So if you're trying to look to see what the PTT level is, or if a patient is taking unfractionated heparin, we like to monitor that PTT, so checking the PTT is very helpful for this drug category. Another one, is monitoring what's called your anti-10A level. This isn't a common level, to be honest with you, but you can utilize it. Um, and so what this looks at is it looks at anything that's kind of inhibiting the 10A, whether it be indirectly or directly. <laughs> so you're like, well, wouldn't heparin, unfractionated heparin work? It would. I could technically do any heparin. I could do all the heparins, baby. I could do unfractionated heparin. This could be low molecular weight heparin. This could even be fond of Paranox. This could also be my 10A inhibitor. So my Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, Adoxaban. All of these could be monitored by my 10A level. Isn't that cool? So you're probably like, okay, what about a thrombin level? Nah, we ain't got one. I mean, you could do something called a thrombin time, which may be potentially beneficial. Um, if you really wanted to, you could check something called a thrombin time. Um, and a thrombin time would really specifically look at really only one drug, um, and that is your what's called dabigatran. But it's not the best test. So oftentimes we don't really have true, like, reliable tests to really measure your thrombin inhibitors. So, but dabigatran may be beneficial. Um, other things you could consider, um, your argatraban and bivalarudin. You could consider maybe even sometimes adding those into some of these other tests, but really there's nothing great for those ones as well. I see the ones that truly you would want to know for the test is PTT for unfractionated heparin. Consider anti-XA level and specifically 
low molecular weight heparin, and then your 10A inhibitors, thrombin, thymine, dabigatran. All right, here's another really big one, INR. So INR is what's called your international normalized ratio. And what it does is it looks at something called the PT. So it's based off of your PT. So it takes the, the actual um, time, your prothrombin time of you, and then you divide it by the actual PT of the nearby patient population, like the average of the PT around the patient population you're in. And it gives you a ratio, and that's called your INR. And the INR is really, really important for warfarin. I don't want you to remember a lot of numbers, son of a gun. I don't want you to remember a ton of numbers, but I think that this is one that you could potentially get tested on in the exam. And what we actually prefer is that because warfarin has a very narrow therapeutic index, I used this term before, we really like the INR to appropriately be between two to three. For most patients, you may, may increase the INR to approximately 2.5 to 3.5 if they have like a mechanical valve, right? So if they have like a mechanical valve, you may increase that INR just a little bit more. But for the most part, that's the primary thing to think about, okay? So these are some of them. Other tests that you'd wanna consider is that the patient is bleed bleeding, okay? Especially things like GI bleeds, hemothorax, posterior epistaxis, uterine bleeding, those that can cause a massive amount of blood loss. So if you have a patient who is you know, bleeding, I think it's also reasonable to check and order some other tests. So things that I would actually really consider checking here for a patient population is, if I'm really worried, especially with, this is really more common with GI bleeds, retroperitoneal hemorrhages, massive posterior epistaxis, and massive uterine bleeding, okay? I would check a CBC because the CBC could show me a low number of red blood cells. It could show me a low number of platelets. So this is something else that I would also consider checking. Now your probably like antiplatelets, do they have like any assay that we can like, no, not really. So for antiplatelets, there's nothing really specific. I mean, obviously monitor your platelet levels with antiplatelets because you can potentially develop TTP, but really, no, there's no specific like assay to really monitor the level of an aspirin or you know, P2Y12 receptor blocker. We had the one that determines the response to the drug, but not a level of the drug, okay? So none really specifically for antiplatelets. We talked about most for the anticoagulants, heparin, the uh, 10A inhibitors, not really anything specific for argotraban and bivalirudin, and then INR for warfarin. So I think the most important ones is INR, and PTT level, these two, if you have the brain space to remember them, add them in. And then if you really are concerned that the patient may be kind of bleeding, a CBC to check the red count, and then their platelet count is also kind of beneficial. One more is I would also consider checking something called fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is really kind of coming down to one specific drug, and that's really TPA. Because if you think about it, TPA does break down fibrin, but it also breaks down fibrinogen. So checking that with respect to a patient who's taking TPA and now they're developing bleeding symptoms, that may be a potentially beneficial thing to check in combination with the factors for bleeding, such as a low a red cell count and a low uh, platelet count. Okay, one more thing that I wanna talk about here, guys. When we talk about bleeding risk, so let's put here just like a bleeding risk. So risk of bleeding. I think it's important to be able to kind of understand which ones are really the scary ones, all right? So obviously when you think about these, aspirin is probably gonna be on the lower end, right? And then I would say after that would be kind of like you know, your P2Y12 you know, receptor inhibitors. Then after that I would say you know, these are probably gonna have the higher ones, so GP2B, 3A inhibitors are also gonna be, these probably have a higher risk of bleeding. So if we're going, again, this is the least amount, then this one, then this one, then I would say you're going into any of the anticoagulants. What I would say is I would say if you kind of had like your DOAX and your heparin molecules, those would actually probably have a lesser bleeding risk in comparison to warfarin. But the last one is gonna be any thrombolytic. So I think it's really important to understand that. When a patient is taking these medications, their bleeding risk could be dependent upon which one of these are on. 
So as you go in this direction, if you take these particular medications, there is a higher bleeding risk just inherent to the actual drug category. With warfarin just having a higher bleeding risk than most of the other anticoagulants, GP2B3A inhibitors having a higher bleeding risk than all the other antiplatelets, and thrombolytics having the highest bleeding risk out of compared to all the actual drug categories. That's important. Okay, my friends, here's what I need us to now do. Patient comes in, they take one of these drugs. They got mild bleeding on the skin, mild nasal bleeding, mild uterine bleeding, you know, maybe you got the like, hemarthrosis, not too bad. We'll check these levels, see if we can make any adjustments, maybe hold the dose, decrease the dose, whatever. Or they come in, can't breathe, got a hemothorax, don't have any blood pressure because they have hemopericardium. They're losing blood out of both ends, maybe up through their have massive hematemesis or they're having massive GI bleeding out the other end. Uh, end. And they're, or, or they're losing a lot of blood and they're hypotensive because they have retroperitoneal bleed. Or they can't move their entire right side because they have a big bleed on one of the sides of their brain. In those situations, we have to consider immediately reversing the drugs that potentially cause these problems because maybe they're at super therapeutic levels. And then checking the level accordingly may also be beneficial. But I think the important thing is, is if they have a high bleeding incidence, moderate to severe in, in, in that situation, what medications could I use to reverse some of those drugs? Because this is a high yield. Let's talk about it. All right, my friend, so a patient who comes in, they got some degree of like moderate to severe bleeding. And it's secondary to the antiplatelet, anticoagulant, or the TPA. You check the levels, it confirms which one, now you gotta reverse the drug. All right. Antiplatelets, I really don't want to include this because um, they honestly, you should not reverse these. But if a patient is taking any antiplatelet and they do develop massive bleeding, you could consider, I would highly recommend that you don't, um, there's a lot of evidence to really kind of go against it, but I would say plus or minus something called desmopressin. It may increase or improve the function of platelets. Um, that's it, and I, that's all we're gonna say about that one. And this would go for aspirin, P2Y12 receptor blockers, GP2B3A inhibitors, all of those. Let's move on to the next thing. So we go into the anticoagulants. The first one that we mentioned was heparin. Okay, so with heparin, uh, for this one, it's actually gonna be something called protamine sulfate. So I do want you to remember that one because that's a high yield one. So protamine sulfate is another one. I've given this one a couple times, um, unfortunately. And this is a pretty common one to give as well. Um, not as common as the next one. So you could do this, so when we talk about protamine sulfate, it could be primarily, if I'm actually gonna write this here, unfractionated heparin, way more common than it would be for low molecular weight heparin, okay? The next one is for your DOAX, okay? So this is for your DOAX. But I'm actually, what I really wanna do here is actually more specifically, I want to break them down, and, and the reason why is there's a, there's a special reason here. So your 10, a inhibitor, so rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban. With these, there is a special one out there. Um, it's crazy expensive, and to, be, and to be honest, it found no true difference in benefit from the actual classic drug that we give. But for the rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, um, and dexanet alpha. Uh, but just get ready to break the actual bank and never be able to you know, pay for your mortgage after this one. Um, the other situation here is if you don't have indexinet alpha or you don't want to pay the massive amount of quantities for this drug, which is not any more superior than this other one, then in this other situation, you can give something called four factor PCC. And all this means is it contains factors two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. So it's all these clotting proteins that are essential to actually helping to promote a clot. Um, especially in this case, factor 10. So it's pretty cool in that sense. The other thing here is if we go into the next one. So the thrombin inhibitors. The thrombin inhibitors, um, I want us to kind of also think about here. With thrombin inhibitors, I actually just recently gave this one out, and this is actually a high yield one. So for this one, it's called dabigatran. So dabigatran is that one of the thrombin inhibitors, and this is that PO version. For this one, there is one particular drug, heck of a stinking name. It's called Ida Rakizumab, also known as Praxbind. This is one that you actually really should know because this is going to be the reversal agent for dabigatran. If it's the other versions, so if it's the 
Argatraban, or if it's the um, Bivalarudin, Bivalarudin, these ones you treat with four-factor PCC, okay? So again, recapping, please, for the love of goodness, don't do this with antiplatelet. Don't get platelet and transfusions either, but again, sometimes they may even consider plus or minus platelet transfusion, especially if they're going to be going to get like a neurosurgery. So if they develop like a bleed, sometimes they like to aim for a greater than 100K platelet levels. So they may consider a platelet transfusion or desmopressin. Heparin, protamine, sulfate. More advanced for unfractionated in comparison to low molecular weight. 10A inhibitors and dexin and alpha if you don't want to be able to pay your mortgage. And then four-factor PCC would be the alternative and a lot cheaper. Thrombin inhibitors, the bigger trend, you give idorkizumab. And if it's the argatraban and the bivalerudin, which are the IV versions, it's four-factor PCC. Okay. Warfarin, my friends. We go into warfarin. For warfarin in this poppy here, you give two particular drugs. One is you give IV vitamin K. So you give IV vitamin K. And then the other thing that you also give is you give four-factor PCC. You give this because, again, warfarin inhibits the production of functional 27910 CNS. So you'll actually give them 27910. And then IV vitamin K will replenish the vitamin K that's being inhibited by warfarin so that over a 24 hour period and forward, you actually continue to make functional 27910 CNS, which is pretty cool. If a patient is not like massively urgently bleeding, but they're INR, so another thing is that they're kind of a caveat here, like a, a add on here is that if the patient has a super, super like high INR greater than their level of two to three or 2.5 to 3.5, they have a mechanical valve. You can actually kind of look at that, but no bleeding. So in other words, it's not an emergent indication for this. Then what you can do is you can give them PO vitamin K and hold the dose of warfarin for maybe a day or two and then keep checking their INR until it normalizes. Okay, that's just a little add on there. The last one is TPA, my friends. So for TPA, the reversal agent for this particular situation is you're going to give something called TXA, tranexamic acid. Okay, tranexamic acid is actually going to work specifically to kind of inhibit the fibrinolysis. So it's going to inhibit any further fibrinolysis. But then the other problem here is that you need to give them fibrinogen because TPA also can break down fibrinogen. So I wanna give them back some of the fibrinogen. And so I can give them something called cryoprecipitate, cryoprecipitate. And this is important. Remember I told you with TPA to monitor the patient's fibrinogen levels? If the fibrinogen levels are like less than 150, I would consider giving them cryoprecipitate because guess what cryoprecipitate is? Cryoprecipitate is fibrinogen. And so you're going to basically increase their fibrinogen. The other thing is that with TPA, it actually does break down the connections between the platelets. So you may drop the platelets a little bit. So some patients, you may even need to do uh, a platelet transfusion. But this is really the hallmark is TXA plus or minus cryoprecipitate if they have a really low fibrinogen level. My friends, in this behemoth of a video, in this in, in Avengers Infinity War movie that we just went through, we talked about so many drugs. Let's quickly, and I mean quickly, talk about some cases to cement this stuff in. All right, engineers, let's do some questions here. So first one here, which of the P2Y12 ADP receptor antagonists reversibly binds this receptor? So we didn't actually mention this within this three hour long Infinity War movie that we just uh, talked about today, but really quickly, when we talk about the P2Y12 receptor blockers, all of them, except for ticagrelor, is reversible. Um, and so what the, why is that really important? It really comes down to compliance. So when a patient takes ticagrelor, if they decide, eh, don't wanna take this medication anymore, that's a problem because now they lose their complete antiplatelet effect because it's, it's actually reversible as compared to clopidogrel, prosugrel, teclopidine, those are irreversible. And so it's actually gonna be somewhat more beneficial if a patient decides to miss a couple doses, they'll still get the antiplatelet effect a little bit. So that's very important. So the answer should be ticagrelor. Okay, let's go on to the next one. We got a 70 year old woman diagnosed with non-valvular AFib. That's really important. Her past medical history is significant for chronic kidney disease and her renal function is moderately diminished. Which anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation avoids the need for renal dose adjustment in this patient? Well, oftentimes I think it's important to remember that kind of any of the 
direct factor inhibitors have some degree of renal excretion. Um, and so because of that, I would actually be very cautious putting patients on those medications such as apixaban, dabigatran, or rivaroxaban because they are renally excreted um, way much more so than warfarin. Um, I would actually go ahead and stay away from those and particularly kind of confine myself to warfarin for this indication here. Um, unless you want to monitor their levels way more frequently, such as utilizing like anti-10A levels um, to monitor things like apixaban or rivaroxaban. But Warfarin would be kind of the go-to in that particular scenario. 80-year-old um, woman is taking warfarin indefinitely for the prevention of DVT. Um, compliant, stable INR, denies bleeding, bruising, diagnosed with UTI, prescribed um, Bactrim, uh, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim. Um, what are the expected effects on his warfarin therapy? Well, uh, as we talked about before, Bactrim or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is a CYP450 inhibitor. So whenever warfarin is getting metabolized, if you inhibit the metabolism of warfarin, you'll actually increase the efficacy or the concentration of the warfarin drug within the blood. And so now you're going to have more warfarin running around the blood. You're going to have an increased anticoagulant activity of warfarin. Um, and so you'll have a higher risk of bleeding in these situations. So I would say it would be B, increased anticoagulation effect of warfarin. Antidote for reversing the bleeding. So a 47-year-old woman comes to the ED, severe bleeding. Upon evaluation, um, discover that she takes dabigatran, okay, um, for a history of multiple DVTs. What is the appropriate reversal agent to administer to the patient at this time? Well, it's the, the name to fame is idricizumab. So protamine is for heparin. Um, vitamin K, in addition to things like PCC or um, FFP, can be given for things like um, warfarin. Um, Idrochizumab is particularly for dabigatran, um, and so reverse agent does not exist for this medication. That's not necessarily true. So dabigatran, we would give idrochizumab as a monoclonal antibody as a reversal agent for that drug. All right. Um, which must heparin bind in order to exert its anticoagulant effect? Um, so, so generally it binds on to antithrombin 3, right? So naturally heparin is a part of our normal kind of molecule within the body. So it's an endogenous molecule, so heparin sulfate, right? And it usually will bind antithrombin-3 um, and enhance the activity of antithrombin-3, which will break down things like thrombin, factor 5, factor 8, et cetera. So um, in this situation here, I would definitely say antithrombin-3 would be the primary one that it would actually be able to exert its anticoagulant effect via. Um, fibrin selective. So which is considered fibrin selective because it rapidly activates plasminogen that is bound to fibrin. Um, so we talked about the kind of thrombolytics within the lecture of anticoagulants and I thought it was a good one to throw in there with them. Um, and that this is going to be things that activate the plasminogen that helps to be able to convert it into plasma which breaks down fibrin. That would be specifically things like altaplase or tenecteplase. So any type of TPA molecule would be the best situation here. So altaplase, tenecteplase, um, streptokinase, those kinds of things. So in this situation, I would say it's primarily going to be all to place. So A. 56-year-old um, man presents the ED with complaints of swelling, redness, and pain in his right leg. So diagnosed with a DVT. Um, provider wants to start an oral agent, okay, which drug is the most appropriate for the treatment of DVT in this patient. So rivaroxaban is an oral agent. Uh, Batrixaban does not really utilized really often. It can be used prophylactically, but not for acute DVT. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever used it or seen it in practice ever. Um, anoxaparin is a heparin molecule, um, primarily given via IV. Um, and then uh, clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is not an anticoagulant, it's an antiplatelet, so that would be best in this one. So I'm kind of left with uh, batrixaban and rivaroxaban as the primary two oral agents here. Um, again, this is not for acute DVT, it's primarily prophylaxis, um, and I don't think I've ever seen it utilized ever once. So rivaroxaban would be the correct answer. This is a factor 10 A inhibitor, and so is batrixaban, but again, it's going to be rivaroxaban for this answer here. All right. Which is the most appropriate for reversing the anticoagulant effects of heparin? Hmm. Uh, so protamine sulfate is going to be the primary answer here. So again, you can give vitamin K. Vitamin K would be good in situations such as in warfarin related, um, which can give it kind of a good 24-hour control. Hopefully it'll help to activate some of those vitamin K epoxide reductase enzymes and help to kind of increase the synthesis of factor 2, 7, 9, 10 um, protein CNS. But generally, vitamin K is going to be for warfarin. Uh, TXA is for things like, you know, uh, thrombolytics, like TPA. Um, so altoplase, tenecteplase, protamine sulfate is going to be primarily, again, um, given for situations such as patients who have uh, heparin-related bleeding. So I would give protamine sulfate.
Um, 62-year-old man taking warfarin for stroke prevention and AFib presents to his PCP with an elevated INR of 10.5 without bleeding, so that's good, um, and is instructed to hold his warfarin dose given oral vitamin K. Um, generally, it should be given IV vitamin K, but it doesn't matter. Um, given oral vitamin K, which one of the would, what, when would the effects of vitamin K and the INR most likely be noted on this patient? So I already said that, kind of 24 hours. So you can give things like um, a PCC, so um, we call that the prothrombin complex concentrate. Um, you can also give things like FFP, um, but those will help to replenish directly factors 2, 7, 9, 10, uh, protein CNS. But, um, you know, generally vitamin K will be something that over a 24-hour period will help you to continue to synthesize more of those factors, such as factors 2, 7, 9, 10, protein CNS. So I'd say 24 hours for vitamin K, immediate effect from things like PCC um, or FFP. A 58-year-old man receives uh, intravenous alteplase treatment for acute stroke. Five minutes following the alteplase infusion, he develops angioedema. I've actually seen this once. Um, it's very interesting. Um, generally, you give them steroids and, and antihistamines and just be careful watching their airway. But which of the following drugs may have increased the risk of developing angioedema in this patient? And that would be an ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitors naturally have that ability to increase the um, bradykinin production by inhibiting the breakdown of bradykinin. So they end up um, they end up causing higher levels of bradykinin, causing vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, and swelling of the um, upper airway structures, which can definitely be precipitated whenever a patient gets a TPA-related infusion for a stroke. It actually has a double kind of whammy effect. But you can see this, and it's kind of frightening sometimes when you do see it, but it would be an ACE inhibitor. All right, my friends, that would cover all of the questions that you guys need to know about anticoagulants and thrombolytics. I hope it made sense. I really do. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for sticking in there. Thanks for watching the video. Thank you for being so supportive of us. And uh, engineers, love you. Thank you. And as always, until next time.